I call to order the City of Bloomington Board of Zoning Appeals for the for November the 19th, 2020. Roll call, please. Clapper. Here. Husky. Here. Sandberg. Here. Burrell. Here. Throckmorton. Here. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we do not have um, uh, approval of meetings for this month. Those uh, June meeting notes will wait till next month. Yes, thank uh, you. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, reports, resolutions, and communications? Yeah, we just have one report. There was a, a petition that appeared at Plan Commission in October um, where we, uh, it was for 2670 East 2nd Street, and we thought a variance was going to be required for to landscape standards for that petition. Um, because of the way the new UDO um, splits up uh, how site plan, um, how the site plan regulations are in the code, um, we inadvertently thought that variance was required. It is not. Um, the condition of approval for that site plan said that a variance was required if needed, so the site plan is still good. We wanted to say that here at the Board of Zoning Appeals, uh, we did um, reach out to the neighborhood that was most interested, but in case there are other people attending tonight expecting to see that, uh, the variance is not required and that site plan can go forward um, as normal. And that's the only uh, uh, announcement we have. Thank you. Thank you. We have one petition that will be continued to our December hearing and that's CU slash V-19-20, Robert Iaterola. And this evening, uh, we have several petitions to hear. The first one is AA-8-20, the Annex Group. Uh, AA-17-20, WDG Construction. V-24-20, Catalan, Indiana, LLC. V-25-20, Mark Hood and Christine Hack. And V-26-20, Ace, 318 LLC. So we will begin with the first uh, petition, AA 8 20, the Annex Group. Uh, can I please have the um, staff report? Yes, that will be from me. Just a second, I'll share my screen. Okay, thanks. Uh huh. Sorry, just a sec, one moment. Okay, sorry about that. Way too many things open on this screen. Okay, um, the first petition uh, that we are looking at tonight, um, as Ms. Clapper said, is uh, AA0820. Uh, it is a um, administrative appeal. So we've discussed these in the past. Um, the petition site is located at 1100 North Crescent. And um, the petitioner uh, received a series of notice of violations, including a final um, fine 
uh, notice of violation and they are um, appealing that notice of violation. So again, the property is located at 1100 North Crescent um, and is uh, zoned PUD. Property is currently under construction. I believe with uh, at this time now having one building, maybe two open. Um, and our senior uh, zoning compliance planner, um, uh, Liz Carter is here tonight as well. Um, if we have more specific questions about the site. So multiple um, notices of violation were issued for the site. Um, uh, the first was on um, December 30th, a notice of violation was issued for the site and uh, that listed um, three environmental violations. Um, so those were listed as tracking waste and material and soil stockpiles. Those are three sections um, of the code uh, that were uh, being violated. And the deadline given for compliance of those was uh, January 6th of 2020. So a fairly quick turnaround, um, not a uh, um, heavy lift to fix. Um, you can see it was items such as um, here in the middle of this picture is a pile of um, basically someone uh, washing out concrete onto the ground. You're not supposed to do that. It's supposed to be in a contained area so that it can be taken away. Um, you know, uh, not maintaining the internal roadways so that when a vehicle then leaves the site, then they're tracking out um, onto the public roadways. Uh, those were the types of things um, we uh, uh, noticed them of. So, um, as I mentioned, the deadline was January 6th. On January 7th, a second NOV was issued uh, for the same environmental uh, violations because uh, the site had not been brought into compliance. Um, they were given an additional uh, week from the first deadline, so um, given till January 13th. Um, and then fines, it says in the letter dated uh, on January 7th, that fines will begin to accrue on the 13th uh, if the um, violations are not remedied. So on the 13th, um, an inspection was completed. Uh, the violations were not remedied, as well as um, an additional violation of drainage inlet protection uh, was found to be, uh, uh, was found on the site and added uh, to this NOV. So fines began accruing on the 13th, as had been stated would happen in the violation uh, notice that was sent on the 7th. And um, the letter here on the 13th indicated that uh, those violations would um, continue to accrue until compliance was achieved and compliance was achieved on uh, the 24th. So then what then we do uh, send a final notice of violation detailing the final fine amount uh, and a time period for which fines were assessed. Uh, so again, fines began on the 13th and uh, con continued until compliance was met on the 24th. Um, the way that the fines are uh, described in the Bloomington Municipal Code, we are allowed to fine up to $2,500 per environmental violation per day. Um, so uh, for example, if there were multiple track out violation, uh, track out onto two streets, we could see those as separate uh, and fine $5,000 a day. Um, we, instead of, uh, taking the three uh, violations that were listed in the NOVs um, that were not immediately rectified. Um, as separate violations, the department chose to just fine uh, a total of um, $2,500 a day um, in, in totality instead of for each. Um, so the petitioner is appealing that notice of violation. Um, the department feels that it's clear that the violation occurred. Um, as we've discussed in the past, the Board of Zoning Appeals cannot uh, weigh in on the amount uh, that was included, only on whether or not the violation um, is valid, the notice of violation is valid, um, and uh, then uh, amount, amount appeals have to be done in court. Um, so the department is recommending denial of this administrative appeal request, and I can answer any questions. Uh, I have a question. Oops. Thank you, Jackie. Sure. Um, we'll do questions after we hear from a petitioner. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, is there a petitioner's representative here? Okay. Could you please state your name? Excuse me. My name is Christopher, uh, Christopher Lucart. I'm general counsel with the Annex Group, uh, which is the sponsor of 
uh, Union at Crescent LP, the developer of that property. Thank you. Um, do you swear to tell the whole truth? Um, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. You have up to 20 minutes to uh, present your petition. I don't, I don't think it'll take 20 minutes. I um, realized I was on, I had muted my computer, so I missed most of uh, Ms. Scanlon's uh, presentation. And so not exactly sure all that she said other than, I, I mean, I know what's in the, um, the notices and, and that kind of stuff. So I th think um, our, you know, I, I wanna go back and just paint a, a little bigger picture as to why we're, um, trying to appeal, and, and I'm not necessarily appealing the per day dollar figure or what have you, but um, you know, back in, in December, we were uh, fighting to, there's three buildings in this development, we were fighting to get one of the buildings um, uh, certificate of occupancy as th this is an affordable housing project. And we had a list of uh, residents that needed housing um, and so, we were hoping to be able to get one building completed in December, which we were able to do, but not until the very end of the month. I think residents moved in on December 23rd, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, and so admittedly, we probably didn't pay as close attention to the rest of the site as um, we did to that particular building in, in that particular area. Um, the city was nice enough to um, allow us to sort of split the one building off for purposes of getting a, a TCO and, and you know those kinds of things so that we could at least get residents into the one building. Um, we, once we accomplished that as an office, we um, shut the office down for a couple of weeks. So the first notice dated December 30, we did not even receive in our office until January 6, just by, because we were shut down and, and stuff. So, um, once we got the notice, we of course passed it on to the uh, contractor on site. Um, I think if you look at the pictures between the um, the six, which is when we got the, that first notice and then the 15th or the 13th, I guess when the second notice was sent, or I guess it might've been the third notice was sent. Um, there was there was uh, progress made on the cleaning up of the site and however there were some different issues I think that appeared in that time so we went back to the contractor who is also related to our entity in, in full disclosure um, and said you need to get this entire site cleaned up not just you know the things that they um, referenced in, in the January 6th and January 15th uh, um, notices and then by the 23rd which was the, that next week they had they were in we were in substantial compliance and then 24th full compliance so I think if you if you look at the point of, of you know I'm not I could go into each picture and, and try to explain away everything I don't know that that's worth anybody's time honestly at this point um, I do think the pictures are snapshots um, that maybe aren't fully representative of the entire site, but um, I think that, um, uh, you know, our our biggest issue was just the timing of everything. Um, we didn't, like I said, we didn't get the first notice till the 6th, the second notice was dated the 6th, um, and we didn't get that until the 7th, and the third notice was dated the 13th, we didn't get that until the 15th, and then that last, um, inspection then was the 23rd or 24th and that notice wasn't sent until uh, early February. Um, and so I feel like we were trying to get ourselves in compliance and just sort of, you know, had one issue um, that we got cleared up and then had another issue pop up. So um, I guess I would ask for some leniency with these fees. Um, the only other thing that I would say is our um, superintendent was uh, battling cancer as well. And so that created some uh, issues for us, of course. Um, we did have you know, other uh, employees on site, but um, just there was a lot going on on, on that site. Um, and um, thankfully, you know, the project is completed and almost fully um, leased up now. And you know, at the end of the day, we're happy with everything that's done and we're happy to be partners with the city um, 
just really asking for some leniency here and, and the circumstances of the timing over the holidays and, and the bad weather and stuff, um, making things look probably worse than they really were um, at the time. So. Thank you. Uh, we are to the board for questions at this point. Joe, did you have some questions? Yeah, sure, I'm happy to start. Um, thank you, uh, Christopher, for that. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, so first I wanna to see if maybe I can get a clearer statement of on what grounds you're asking for an administrative appeal. What's the underlying grounds rather than, I, didn't, I don't think I quite heard that. So I think the grounds are that we, um, we didn't receive the first notice uh, until the six and each, um, and then we immediately started um, working on compliance. And, um, you know, by the time we got to the 24th, um, each week, I think if you look at the pictures, yes, there, there's still some issues, but they're different issues each week. So we were getting in compliance and one notice and putting ourselves in a bad spot at another place and, and what have you. So. Um, you had stated a couple of things. Admittedly, you did not pay as close attention as you should, you stated. Um, and you said progress was made in one area, but then different issues appeared. Um, and then I think the final uh, thing you said was what weather contributed. Um, dealing with the last statement about weather contributed, um, is that not kind of why there are mitig there are um, policies in place because weather can cause mud, can cause runoff, can cause uh, environmental issues. So yeah, I, I think if you look at, oh, sorry. Appeal? Yeah, so I think if you look at like pictures uh, one through five on, on that first notice, um, you know, we did actually have a, 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 a bit of, you know, the rock, uh, rock road um, as required. Uh, but there was a lot of rain and snow um, in, in that time period. And so every time it would rain, mud would seep up through, percolate up through the rock and, and what have you. Um, and then once it would, you know, and then after a day or so, it, it disappear again. And so, um, you know, I think we tried to be in compliance um, with that. Uh, I also think that, you know, my statement about uh, fixing some issues and having other ones. If you look at the dirt pile, um, you know, disappeared from, you know, one notice to the next. So there, there is things that were done to put ourselves in compliance, but each time um, the, um, you know, somebody came out to inspect, um, other issues popped up. So I think, I feel like each notice, we're arguing, I guess, that each notice had actual different violations under the same code, but different actual violations on the site. So um, not, sure, not sure that it's the same um, actual issue throughout that would warrant um, a fine. I, I think what I'm also asking is, um, you're asking for an administrative appeal. You're asking us to to give you an appeal because there's what there was bad weather. What you said weather contributed to it. So what I'm trying to understand is one of your grounds for asking for an appeal for us to make a decision is that because of bad weather, we should grant the appeal. Well, no, I mean, you're not gonna grant an appeal for bad weather. <laughs> but mean, that's what you just asked. But for. that's, but part of the, I, I'm just trying to explain part of what you're seeing in these pictures. Well, we, I understand that. I do understand what I'm seeing, but okay. I'm trying to also understand under what, under what rationale we could grant you an appeal. Okay. So you were, I, I'm trying to just work through those, to make sure I understand. So one of those is that, you know, it was bad weather. That's, so you're saying that they yeah, can't really grant you that because, you know, you guys are in construction. Bad weather is part of the deal. Mm -hmm. Is my understanding. The other thing was that you were out of the office between the period in December and January 6. So that was a choice to be made that you didn't check anything for what was it two weeks, a week. That was an administrative choice, correct? Yes. Okay, so you want us to grant so the another grounds is that we should grant the appeal because you chose not to have anyone check anything on the site for that period to know that you were in violation. 
Well, not on this. Well, in, in our office, um, right. we okay. were closed. Yeah. Uh, but what I guess the, the point being, you know, as soon as we got the appeal or the notice, we you know, started um, forcing the contractor to put the site in compliance. Mm. It, then, just didn't, it just right. didn't start on the 30th, it started on the 6th. So, But it also took another 10 days after the second violation on the 13th. And I guess my question to you again on the grounds for appeal is, is 10 days not, an, not enough to correct these types of issues? What, I'm not in construction. Well, I think, you know, you have an active job site. Um, and I think that from the, you know, we did have, for example, we did have street sweepers out there every um, afternoon and every evening, um, you know, so, so we were doing things that, you know, to keep ourselves in compliance. Um, and I do think, you know, we did get it cleaned up in, in the 10 days from the 13th to the 20th uh, or 24th or 23rd. Um, so I think, you know, we did that. It's probably the, as best of a job as we could have gotten done at that time. It would have taken 10 days. My last question. Uh, One more question. Uh, okay. President yeah. is, uh, uh, President uh, Park, is the, um, uh, the statement of admittedly, we did not play as close attention as we should. I think that that's kind of telling there there is an admission there in asking us for an administrative appeal that they didn't pay as close attention as they should have um, and perhaps that's why and we can discuss that later why the city would have certain policies in place in order to encourage people who are doing construction to pay attention Joe, do you have a question uh, uh, that was the question to him yeah it, so to clear so to clarify that statement um, in December, like I said, we were working hard um, with the city to get one building completed so that we could get residents in there um, that you know had had signed leases and, and had been approved from a uh, income standpoint um, to or qualified from an income standpoint to live in in the um, affordable housing. So we needed to get those people in there. So all of the focus was on completing the one building. Um, during the month of December, especially you know early mid December, and so that that was the point of um, you know my statement, and so the we weren't focused so much on the other two buildings and, and the site around the other two buildings as we were the the one building. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question, sort of a uh, clarification from the from the what we just heard for for Jackie and potentially for the compliance officer. Uh, the comment um, that Mr. Lucart made about uh, there being different issues over time that uh, needed to be addressed, that it that that the um, the citations, the items that were cited, were remedied, but that there were different issues that arose um, sure. that kind of continued the. Um, the sequence of of um, you know sightings of noncompliance could could either Sorry. you or the yes. compliance officer okay. I think Liz could speak to it. I will briefly say that the way that our our code is organized, um, if a uh, property owner or petitioner um, has um, has the same type of violation over time, even if it's not at the same location, um, uh -huh. we. Uh, for example, if we fine you for a violation on site A and then a year later you do the exact same violation on site B, uh, they um, pile, they stack on each other. So it's uh, seen as a second violation, not a new one. That's not exactly the same situation here, uh, but just to uh, just as um, we uh, just as seeing that we see more of it, uh, the, the code focuses it more on as an issue of the violation, not exactly site specific. Um, but I will let Liz speak to that briefly uh, in just a second. But I also wanted to briefly clarify um, that there are no um, uh, notice uh, timeline requirements, right? So we could begin finding the day we see an initial violation. Mm -hmm. uh, Liz had been out to the site twice in December before the first letter was sent because we knew that they were in a hurry to, you know, they were trying to meet this uh, occupancy deadline and we were working with them quite closely to help that along. Um, and so for stalling the notice of violation and not going to, for example, a stop work order, uh, it is a courtesy uh, that the city does not have to um, do, but we we did in this case. 
Um, Liz, can you speak to the um, idea of the uh, of the violation uh, being in different spots on the site each time? And Jackie, I have to swear Liz in, don't I? Oh, I. Uh, she's a staff person. So no. Okay. I don't think so. Mm -mm, she'd okay. be at the table. Okay. Um, I'm Liz Carter. I'm the senior zoning compliance planner. Um, so I would say some of the violations were in different spots. Some weren't. So Jackie has up right now the picture. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I do think we need to swear Liz in. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, Barry. <laughs> no problem. Could you please state your name? Uh, my name is Elizabeth Carter. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the picture Jackie has up right now is the main access drive that went all the way through um, the project. So our code, for example, speaks to access drives being kept um, clean with crushed stone. This was a consistent problem every time we came out. So like there were some things that were consistent every time we visited. Um, we did try in some cases to show pictures if we saw something new to try to help um, the, the construction company just by showing them here. Um, this is another example of, for example, Jackie showed the concrete washed out on, on the ground. We saw that a couple different places, um, but it, it, again, it's the same violation happening again and again, just because it's not happening at the same spot we checked a week prior doesn't mean the violation has stopped. Okay. Um, so same thing, there's some pictures in one of them about like improperly disposed of paint. That's the same issue as the concrete. Our code just has um, improper material disposal as a section that we cite. So the paint would count, the concrete would count. It just, it was ongoing. And again, those are spelled out pretty explicitly, I think in the letters. So um, yeah, while it was different spots in the site, sometimes I do think there were some consistent ones. For example, the tracking. Um, and they mentioned that they were sweeping up the tracking off the road. Our code makes it so that it is not okay to track onto the road in the first place. Mm -hmm. So sweeping it up is great. You know, we appreciate that. It's better than not, but the tracking occurring at all is the violation. So, and you know, we were, that was consistent throughout as well. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. That's really helpful. Um, do, do any other uh, commission members have questions? I have a question. Yes. So um, <clears throat> I heard that, so there were several types of violations. And then he said that he, um, the petitioner said that he was, they were correcting the violations as they went. So how, how do we know that by the time January 13th came along, what violations had been uh, corrected, if any? And if, uh, if, or how do you determine how many were corrected before uh, January 23rd? And I don't even know if that is even relevant, but uh, I'm just curious because he said things kept popping up. So uh, were, was he correcting, was, were they correcting uh, the violations? And then when they came to check, they would find another violation and the previous one was corrected. I was just want some, clarification on that. Liz, do you have a clarification for that? Sure. I would say um, sometimes, so for example, if we showed a picture in the last letter of some concrete on the ground, it did seem like the contractor would go clean that up, but it wasn't like they were taking a holistic approach to their site. I mean, when we go walk their site, we walk every inch of it. We don't just check, spot check the few places that we'd been, um, that we'd noticed violations the time before. We walk the entire thing. Um, so, and that was sort of the, the problem, it seems that they were like going off of the pictures that we were putting in the letter and correcting just those things and not thinking about what else was ongoing at the site. Um, so, like I said, I think some things were getting corrected from the letters, um, but for example, the tracking, the crushed stone street throughout the project, that was just ongoing and it kept appearing in the letters. So, so Liz, just as, just to further clarify, so the, the violation is 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 really um, kind of a comprehensive thing, and then there could be uh, a, a many different examples or multiple examples of the same violation. 
That's right. Okay. That, yes, that that's correct. So yeah. So for example, the the easy one is probably the um, improper material disposal one. So mm -hmm. if the site has that occurring on it, it's in violation of that portion of the code. Whether it's the one spot we noticed the last time, or a new one, or both. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Can I ask a question to staff? Sure. Thanks. Um, Jackie, I was wondering, I just want to clarify exactly what it is that we're making a decision about um, with regard to the appeal. That's the entire appeal. So our only options here are, yes, they were in violation or no, we, they weren't. Or so the, yeah, and Mike, is, oh, I'm sorry to cut you off. Go, no, no, that's it, go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, Mike Rooker can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but what you will be saying is uh, that you either agree with them that the uh, administrative appeal or parts of it, uh, I'm sorry, that the notice of violation or parts of it were um, um, incorrectly issued or not. Um, Mike, does that, is that an okay way to describe it? I mean, it's hard because usually uh, we say it in a little bit more of a cut and dry way, which is you're, uh, you're saying whether or not this notice of violation was issued correct, properly. Um, but their argument is a little bit not saying that it wasn't. They're just kind of asking for some relief and you aren't able to give them financial relief. Um, you're not. Okay. Right. Okay. So you'll basically either be reaffirming that the notice of violation seems accurate based on the record, the notice of violations and pictures and things that were included in your packet, um, or uh, that it seems like uh, that the notice of violations were issued in error. So Mike, I need does to that sound? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, finish. I was just going to say, um, Mike, do you have anything to weigh in on that description? No, that's probably accurate. Uh, I'm Michael Rooker, city attorney for the city. And uh, just to weigh in there, you're deciding whether or not you believe the violations occurred. So, and, and the city code was violated. That's in fact what you're deciding. In this case, there are alleged to be three separate violations. So uh, in theory, you could decide that some of those violations should be um, founded and some should not be, uh, but that's the, that's the board's role in this administrative appeal. Thank you. That, uh, so basically what we're saying is any extenuating circumstances are not relevant to the conversation. Not here, correct. Okay. I would point out again, just, just by way of people, people watching at home and how the department typically operates, we could be finding $2,500 a day, up to $7,500 a day sure. for these per mm -hmm. violation. And we know, we knew, you know, what kind of pressure they were under. We have been working with them. Uh, Liz had been going out every two weeks. Uh, and so the fine amounts that we chose based, uh, you know, were based on the whole of the um, project and uh, uh, yeah, that's all. Actually, just to follow up on what you're saying there, um, despite the fact that there was only a week between each notice uh, or a little more, there was overall quite a bit of time involved. Were they in touch with you at any point uh, through phone or email or something to discuss the problems they were having and trying to address the notices? Um, yes, I can let Liz can answer that better than I can. I will point out, I think I may have already said these dates that she was on site on December 13th and December 23rd uh, with on-site inspections with the crews there um, because they were working towards occupancy. Um, and so having discussions with them in person uh, is very typical. I would assume that that had happened. But um, Liz, can you speak to whether or not we um, got contact once the NOV started being issued? Um, sure. So I did not receive any email contact. I do not think we got any phone calls. And this, is, again, is my memory from January. I do not believe we had contact until we started getting into fines. We would talk to them a little bit on the site. Um, I, they would kind of, the, the gentleman on site would, you know, meet with us, you know, hey, what are you guys here for? We'd say we're here for another erosion control inspection. They'd walk with us for a little bit. They, they wouldn't walk the entire site with us even. Okay. And granting that, again, this really isn't what we're making a decision about. It is to tell though that if uh, they engage in a conversation with you, you often are willing to work with the contractors to help them get things done. Yes, um, our preference is to get them done. Oh, sorry, Liz. No, ahead. no, no, you're fine. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, if, if we can help, if we can understand the situation, you know, obviously we can, we can work with them. But um, 
I don't believe we were ever asked for extensions on, um, on the deadlines given in the NOVs. So um, it just sort of, yeah, just every week until we, we hit fines. Okay, thank you very much. And um, just to follow up on that last uh, comment uh, by you, Liz, I, th I think that I saw in the letters that there is a period of time, um, a, a five day period uh, of time after which the, the citations were, were um, leveled that they can, they can um, lodge a- The administrative appeal. The, the administrative appeal. Yep. With, but with each letter, there's that yes. opportunity to, to say this isn't right or- Correct. What have you, right? Correct. And that, none of that happened? No. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Well, thanks for clarifying that we we are not here to decide on the amount that the fines will uh, are they're going to be awarded to, to the city. That that is not our decision. That our decision is to focus on uh, the process. Correct. Yes. Thank you. Okay. If we have no further uh, questions. Uh, at this point, uh, we'll see if there's anybody here from the public who would like to speak to this petition. If Very so, please, uh, are we raising hands? They can either point? raise the digital virtual hand or turn their camera on and wave. There aren't too many we should be able to catch. Okay, and, and Jackie will look for that. I don't see anybody thus far. Let me check Facebook really fast. Nope. No, we should be good. Okay. Then we are back to the petitioner for any final comments. I believe you have time remaining. Uh, I, I don't know that there's a whole lot else to say. I think, um, you know, you've heard um, what we're, you know, looking for. We, um, um, you know, your decision, I guess it sounds like is either, um, we were in compliance or we weren't. And so um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Oh, I, I, well, sorry, one more thing. One thing I did want to comment on. I don't know, um, there was some discussion about whether we reached out um, or contacted um, Liz or, or, any, or uh, Jack, Jackie or anybody at, with the city um, after receiving these notices. I do not know if that occurred. Um, and so I, I can't, you know, I would love to say, yes, we did, <laughs> but um, I, I, I don't know if that occurred or not, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we are back to the board for action. I'm gonna move uh, approval of recommendations on AA-08-20 and the, my understanding if I write correctly is approval is to um, agree with the uh, staff uh, findings to deny the AA. Yeah, I think the motion should be recommending denial of AA. Even though you have the recommendations on there to deny it. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's different than a normal petition. Yes. Okay. Then, uh, I know then, what you're saying. Okay, I, I, that's why. I yeah. That last part. So I, I will a uh, motion for denial of AA-08-20. Okay. Second. Second. Any further discussion? I just, uh, Madam President, I just want to make one comment, which was, I, I think where we are is, is where uh, Christopher left it, which is, you know, the decision is either they're in compliance or not. I do want to reinforce what I think Cassandra and a few others were going through, which is time was given to them to comply. Um, in those, if you look at those letters, there, there was a brief period of time where uh, these could have been mitigated, but attention was given to opening the building rather than to being worried about the violations, uh, again, by you know, mission of council. So I, I just want there to be some clarity in this decision that the city, I think, was being quite reasonable, um, but Christopher does bring it down to were they in compliance or not, and that's why I'll, I'm voting to deny. Okay, thank you. I think we're ready for a vote. Great. Husky? Yes for denial. Yes is for denial, yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> yes. Sandberg? Yes. Burrell? Yes. 
Throckmorton? Yes. And Clapper? Yes. Okay, the petition is denied. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we are on to our second case, which is AA-17-20, staff report, please. That is WDG construction. Okay, that's me again. Uh, this is um, an administrative appeal. Uh, properties located at 910 and 916 North College uh, and 913 North Walnut. Um, the property uh, at the time of the violation was under construction. Uh, when the construction started, the property was zoned CG, and then we had our UDO update, of course, and now it's zoned MM. Um, so one of our um, uh, middle uh, commercial zoning districts. The notice, these notice of violate, this notice of violation was also issued for uh, non-compliance with environmental standards, um, and the petitioner appealed that notice. Uh, so these are just some images here, some tracking out, blocking, improper uh, blocking and cleaning of uh, the inlets, uh, sediment leaving the site because of improper installation of uh, silt fencing. So on uh, May 29th of 2020, a notice of violation was issued. Um, the violations listed uh, were tracking drainlet inlet protection and sediment control. Um, a month, almost a month later on June 26, another, after another site visit, uh, another notice of violation was issued um, for the same environmental violations, plus the addition of the waste and material disposal, plus the addition of non-compliance with their uh, grading permit because we were having an issue where they were consistently blocking sidewalks uh, around the property, um, making them impassable and um, out of um, compliance with PROWAG standards that the city uh, follows um, for accessibility of sidewalks. Um, in this violation that was sent on the 26th, a deadline um, was given of July 3rd, um, indicating that fines would begin to accrue at that time if uh, the violation standards were not corrected. Um, we did not actually inspect the site until the 6th, uh, which was the following Monday, giving them an extra weekend, uh, um, uh, an extra day or two there. And then compliance was not found at this site until the 22nd. Uh, oh, actually that should maybe say the 11th. Liz will have to correct me on that. Um, Liz, is it the 11th? Um, they, yes, they came into full compliance on the 11th. Yes, thank you. Sorry, that's a typo. That's Sorry right. about that. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so then we sent the final uh, notice of violation detailing those fines uh, uh, once the site was into compliance in August. So again, the deadline was uh, July 3rd, and that was not the first deadline, um, but that was the deadline where we said, okay, it needs to be fixed by this day or fines will begin to accrue. And then fine, uh, the site came into compliance eight days later. Um, I believe at this site as well, um, the notice uh, was a little bit different in this case because we had more um, direct contact with this contractor. So as these letters were sent out in the mail, they were also immediately emailed out. Um, so it was, again, tight timelines. Again, we're not required to give any time at all, uh, but we did, in this case, we're able to basically immediately notify uh, those um, contractors working on site um, of the issues. So we are also recommending denial um, of this administrative appeal as well. And I can uh, answer questions. Thank you. Oh, Barry, you muted. Okay. There you go. Petitioner's uh, representative. I don't actually know who the petitioner's representative is. If you could turn your camera on. Um, or send me a message so I can unmute you. That would be helpful. Um, Jackie, I think yes. Chris is on. Oh, okay. I think it's Chris. Okay, thank you so much. Chris, I think you can unmute yourself. There you go. Chris Deckhart. Could you, are you there? Chris, are you with us? Chris, are you there? Okay. 
Jackie, what are we doing in this case? Well, that is very interesting. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> hold on a second. Okay. Let me see who we sent the. Um, is he on? Chris Deckard. Well, let me just. I don't know who else might be here. I'm just basically, I don't know. Liz, do you not recognize any of these other names? Chris was the only one I recognized. I mean, okay. there's a phone number of a call yeah. somewhere. I don't know who that is though. Okay. Uh, do we, uh, would we Mike, continue? Yeah, Mike, hello? can we? Oh, hello. hello. Hi. Hello. Are you I the? I don't know this. It doesn't seem to be working very well. So can you hear me now? Yes. Are you the petitioner for the CDG uh, administrative appeal? Uh, yeah, WDG construction. I'm yeah. sorry. Chris yes. Decker. Yes. Yes. Chris, Chris Decker. Wonderful. Wait. Sorry about that. That's okay. That's okay. Could you please, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Could you please state your name? Chris Decker. Decker. And uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. You have up to 20 minutes to present your petition. Okay. Um, again, it won't take that long. Um, basically, uh, we received the letter that was dated 626 on uh, the 30th of June. Um, I was traveling for another project out of state in Alabama and was notified by um, our office, uh, Rob Toll, on July 1st at which time we tried to get uh, Goodman Construction out there to remedy um, uh, these issues with the soap fence and uh, uh, some of the um, uh, dirt areas. And uh, unfortunately being around the holidays, we could not get them out there until the six. And then the work was completed by the 10th. And uh, as Liz was stating, she, um, re-inspected on the 11th and we are in compliance. Um, this is a very difficult site to work on. We were putting three buildings on a site that was really only <laughs> big enough for two. <laughs> um, we, we did our uh, good faith effort in trying to maintain uh, the soap fencing and, and cleaning the sidewalks and the roads. Obviously the pictures um, uh, that were taken at that time we were fighting a losing battle. Um, however, we did stay at it. And I believe we were in uh, communication with Liz and her office um, um, quite often. Um, other than that, um, uh, that's basically what was done to, to come in compliance. Thank you, Mr. Deckard. Okay. Um, uh -huh. We are to uh, the board with questions and I will start. Um, Liz, I, the first notice of these violations went out at the end of May. The, the, the notice that was sent at the end of June restated the violations and added the language about the fines, correct? Um, I believe so. Let me look real quick. Sorry. A twenty nine. Yes, that that is right. Okay, because uh, just because I want to under, I just wanted to make sure I understood because really the notice of the violations was sent at the end in of in May, not at the end of June. Yes. So okay. yes, I think yeah. of a different way to say it, or I would probably should have said, or could have said. A, a notice of violation was sent in May. A month later, they still hadn't remedied those issues. We sent another notice of violation with a much shorter uh, turnaround time and a, a, a fine date, and then started to fine at that time, which ended up being about five or six weeks after the original notice of violation for this round. It says in your packet, but just for the uh, record here tonight, 
they actually had received two previous notice of violations for similar um, environmental violations earlier in the construction season, uh, both times remedying them. So we didn't, uh, so they, they weren't uh, accruing uh, as of the May uh, NOV. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for petitioner staff by the commission? Nope. Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the public to see if there's anybody from the public who would like to speak to this petition. Jackie, I don't see anybody. Oh, I don't see anyone. Let me quickly check Facebook, sorry. No, nothing there as well. Okay, then we are back to the petitioner for any additional comments for, with time remaining. Can you hear? Yeah, you, we can hear you now, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just like to reiterate, you know, it was a small site. We did our, our good faith effort to try to maintain the soap and, and get the roads cleaned and, and sidewalk cleaned up. Um, it seemed like every day the soap fences were being torn down, we were putting them back up. Uh, our one superintendent tried to do it himself and it wasn't uh, done right and uh, we had to redo it and um, just trying to get the sub out there to do it we we, we um, struggled with it he was busy with work or couldn't get enough people uh, to address the cell fence on a timely manner um, but other than that I think we communicated with the city um, uh, quite often okay thank and, you uh -huh. Thank you. Yep. We are back to the commission for action. I'll go ahead and move the approval of AA-17-20. To, to the motion is to deny the administrative appeal, correct? Right. Now that you've correct, you explained it to me on the previous one, Jackie, Sorry. yes. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Yes. So thank okay. you for clarifying that. A yes vote would be to deny, to deny the, correct. Uh, appeal. Do I have a second? Yes, second. Thank you. Any discussion? I'll just make a quick comment as to why I made the motion, which was it's the same. Uh, well, it's it's another issue of uh, they admit a failure of compliance. Um, I appreciate, uh, Madam President, the pointing out of the fact that May 29th was the first um, contact of this series of violations. So it went from May 29th to June 26th, then to August 7th. And then I still believe we saw some other issues as late as August in one of the photos. So that's why I have made the motion. And just for clarity, it was it was the middle of July when everything was remedied. Yes. Rather than August. July 11th, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Can I ask your question of staff still at this point? Sure. Yes. Yes, please. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, Jackie, just checking in. These types of violations are standard sort of thing that a general contractor would know you should sure have to deal with throughout operation on a construction site. There's nothing strange about what Bloomington uh, requests or requires. Correct. So we have, uh, yes. So, I, you know, obviously if you've lived in Bloomington and in for any amount of time, there's been a lot of downtown development. We have a lot of small sites that develop and contractors have to work within those constraints. Uh, this site in particular, we had a lot of trouble with that, uh, you know, as admittedly, as uh, Mr. Deckert said, uh, there uh, they seem to struggle more than most. And uh, but it is not a smaller site than we see developed uh, in other areas of downtown. It sounds like oftentimes the people that you deal with have to then prod somebody else to actually do the work, but it doesn't uh, change the fact that the violations are there. Correct. I if, I could, if I could ask a follow up to that, because as a relatively new member of this body. Um, and of course, we're, we've heard two cases now where there seem to be some compliance issues. And uh, my question has to do, I mean, construction is messy, and but we have our, our environmental uh, concerns. 
uh, especially when it's a difficult site and when it's important to keep it, you know, regulated and up to speed. Is there an adequate amount of education to like new companies that are not accustomed to working in Bloomington? Um, I mean, is everybody kind of given the primer on here's what our UDO says, here's sure. what you're going to be expected to do. I just want to yes. make sure yeah. that everybody in advance is willing yeah, that's a good and fair Aaron, question. We're, we're very sure. serious about our environmental protection. Yes. So, um, yes, we have pre-construction meetings before any grading permits are issued uh, where Liz um, and sometimes a planner um, and a person representing the work doing being done in the right of way from the engineering team uh, meet. And we try to be very clear uh, about the conditions on your grading permit that limit what you can and can't do and that we will be checking um, especially at a site, uh, at sites that are very visible, we're not the only ones checking. So lots of people will be uh, sending in comments and pictures uh, if you're not uh, keeping it buttoned up. And that, um, yes, we're pretty, we're very upfront about that. And especially with the on-site visits that um, Liz and Emily both do, um, our two compliance planners, uh, they're very um, helpful to the um, um, contractors making suggestions if those, if that's appropriate. Great, that's good to hear. Yeah. And we certainly hear from constituents about block sidewalks. Yeah. So, sure. yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I, I will just add that uh, the set of drawings that are submitted for the project and reviewed by the city contain documentation showing locations of washouts and silt fence. So, all of that is defined um, in the scope of the project up front and is documented. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Okay, if we are ready for um, a vote, I think. I, uh, I have one more comment, sorry. Of course, sure, Flavia. Uh, so I guess a question. So the petitioner, had, once they receive uh, a letter that pronounces that they're gonna be, fi that they are gonna be fined, they still could have appealed for more or asked for an extension for more time. Yes. So if you don't have, if you can't find, if your um, contractor is not able to make it in the time that you have to be compliant, you, you can ask for an extension, correct? Correct. So we, yes, we are under no obligation to not extend uh, if, if that seems appropriate. Um, in some cases, um, in some cases it has borne out and not necessarily this one, but just over time that the only thing that's going to get the work done is the, is the threat of fines or the beginning of the accrual of fines. Uh, and so sometimes that step has to be taken uh, for the work to actually be fixed. But, but typically, yes, we are open to discussion. If there, you know, if you say, Oh, I actually can't get it done for another five days or something, but I can, uh, you know, address those that are safety issues. I mean, those are things we have to get under control as soon as possible. Uh, then we would we could be open to that. Um, yes, it's possible. And and then I guess another question. Uh, and as a it seems as a matter of uh, policy, I don't know if it's stated anywhere, but it you do not begin to levy fines after it's only after you've provided a warning. Correct. That right. That is policy. It's not uh, code. So we could fine immediately, but we uh, almost always or maybe always uh, warn first. Yes just as a courtesy, uh, because the final goal is compliance. Yeah. Anything further from any, any of the commissioners? If not, we are ready for a vote. Great, Burrell? Oh, I'm sorry, so a yes vote is for denial. For denial. Yes. Throckmorton? Yes. Clapper? Yes. Husky? Yes. Sandberg. Yes. The petition is denied. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, our third petition of the evening is uh, V-24-20 Catalan Indiana LLC. Staff report, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a request from Catalent um, for the property that they have here in the city at 1300 South Patterson Drive. Um, the petitioners are here tonight to request a variance from fence height standards 
in order to allow for a seven foot tall fence uh, along their property. Uh, hold on a second, my PowerPoint is not advancing here. Okay, there we go, thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so as I mentioned, this is for the site that they have at 1300 South Patterson Drive. This is part of the Thompson planned unit development. Um, so the property has been developed um, or was developed more specifically with the uh, Thompson factory and RCA factory that existed on the site uh, for a lengthy time period. Uh, the PUD uh, in this area was approved uh, to try to spur the redevelopment here uh, in the mid early 1990s. Uh, Catalan moved into this site uh, early 2000s uh, and utilized the existing buildings um, with just some, some minor modifications, which uh, they're continuing to, to have and experience now. Um, Catalan has been growing on the site, both uh, in terms of the building size, but also employment um, since they have moved on there. Um, and most recently has been charged uh, or awarded a government contract to start working on a vaccine um, for the, or to produce the vaccine for the uh, Corona COVID-19 uh, crisis that we are currently undergoing. Um, and so as, as part of that request, they are requesting to uh, fence in the perimeter of their property with a six foot tall fence. Um, this is something that is recommended uh, or directed to uh, them as part of this contract for the vaccine is to secure their property with a six foot tall fence. Um, so that is, that is why they are coming here today. Um, so as I briefly mentioned with the, the former uses on the site is the Thompson uh, RCA factory. Uh, the site has undergone a lot of changes uh, since that time. Um, so when the property was initially developed, uh, it only had road frontage uh, directly on Allen Street to the north of this. Um, there was a driveway and connection uh, over to Roger Street a little bit, um, but for the most part, uh, the site was accessed from Allen Street. Um, so Patterson Drive, which you can kind of see on the uh, middle of your screen here, actually is an old railroad bed. Uh, used to have a railroad line that served the factories in this property. Um, so that was not converted into the current configuration until the early 2000s uh, when Catalan had moved in here. Um, in addition, there's also a road frontage on the west side of the property uh, with strong drive, uh, strong drive accesses, uh, best beer and organized living uh, just to the west of this. Um, so that's a public street as well. Um, so since this property has developed or initially developed and has been redeveloping, uh, new public streets have kind of been put in along of its frontage. Um, so the, the unified development ordinance does not allow a fence between a building and the street to be taller than four feet tall. Um, so the portions of the site that are north of the building um, that have Strong Drive on the west and Adam or, or Allen Street on the north and then Patterson Drive along the east, uh, because you have public roads there, they would not be allowed to have a fence taller than four feet. Um, so as you can also kind of see with the, the aerial photograph here, there's a very unique shape um, to the Catalan, uh, to the Cook site here. Uh, it's very narrow on the front, much wider in the back. So it makes it very difficult to design or building along the front of this property um, that would allow the, the property to also meet code. Um, so there are a lot of unique conditions about this specific site um, that uh, make it very difficult for them to uh, install the fence that is directed to them for this contract uh, to secure this building and the property uh, uh, as part of this um, contract that they have. Um, so real quickly, here is the site plan that I kind of mentioned of the existing site and parking area along the front. Um, there's a, it, it's also important to note that there's a significant amount of right of way uh, along Patterson Drive, a lot of separation between their property and the actual edge of pavement. Um, so at some portions here, uh, there's almost 40 feet of, of difference between where the property line is and where this fence would be uh, and the sidewalk. Uh, in most of these areas, it's well over 20 feet of separation from the sidewalk to the, the uh, proposed fence. Um, so that distance helps mitigate some of the impact to uh, vehicles and pedestrians. Um, so although the fence is going to be two feet taller, uh, you know, the increased setback here really mitigates a lot of, uh, a lot of those impacts. Um, so the fence is being proposed around the perimeter of the parking areas. 
um, right up against the, the parking areas as, as best as possible. And as I mentioned, we have a significant setback um, from, the, from the adjacent road frontages. Um, so the fence would be a, a wrought iron pole design, as you can see here, uh, with limestone columns. Uh, the columns would be uh, about seven feet tall and would be spaced about a, at least a minimum of 12 feet apart. Um, so in addition, the open style of this fence also helps mitigate any negative impacts. Um, you know, one of the reasons for the limitation on fence height um, it, you know, was, would certainly be most impactive when it's right along a sidewalk and when it's a solid uh, brick structure or a solid structure of some type. Um, so the open style is really, again, helps mitigate any negative impacts as well as uh, the additional setback. Um, so as I, I mentioned both the, in the in early presentation with the aerial photograph and how this site has changed over time, uh, the shape of the property, as I mentioned, was very narrow up on the, uh, the northern end adjacent to the streets, makes it very difficult to construct a building here that would allow this uh, property to meet uh, the UDO requirements for fence height. Um, and so the, the location of the existing buildings and again parking areas makes it very difficult for the property to come into compliance um, and erect this shape uh, of the fence that would be uh, necessary to protect this uh, facility. Um, so that again works towards the, uh, the granting of this variance will allow the petitioner to meet the safety standards uh, that are necessary um, for this facility. Um, so with that, we are recommending approval um, with just the one condition that is listed in staff's report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Eric. Uh, petitioner's representative? Uh, it should be Bill Rigger. Yep, I see him down there. Am I, can you hear me? We can. Okay, I'm muted. So I'm Bill Rigger, and with me tonight is Brian Ford from Catalan. Um, and I guess, do I need to okay. check in first? Bill, Bill, I have to swear you in. Yes. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay. Should I swear Mr. Ford in as well? Perhaps, yes, I think so. Okay. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I think Brian might be muted. Oh, yep, there we there go. Yes, I, I swear. Okay, thank you. Brian, and just state your name, please, for the record. Brian Ford. Thank you. Okay, you have up to 20 minutes to present your petition. Okay, I think Eric's done a really good job of, of explaining why um, our, our need for this particular variance uh, for a taller fence than what's allowed by the new UDO. Um, we did do a little site visit yesterday, and I think we'll probably be keeping the columns a little bit further apart, more so possibly on the order of 50 feet, depending upon where the property takes its bends and turns. It's got, if you notice that property line kind of meanders all along the Patterson Road frontage. And then um, up along Strong Drive, we wanna try and hold that fence as high as possible for security purposes. On the exhibit I prepared, it was down below and pretty much followed the edge of the parking lot, but there's a very steep slope from Strong Drive down toward Catalan's parking lot. And if we set the fence down low, it may not provide uh, the safety we need to, we need. And so we wanna try to have that fence setting higher up along the back of the existing sidewalk. And one thing I'd like to point out too is that actually Catalan, and it was Cook's property before, its property line goes across Strong Drive in some areas with an easement that allows an easement for the city's right of way of the road. Just to point out that the, the Catalan property is a little bit um, outside of the limits of of its actually actual property that you see. I don't know if that's a clear statement or not, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, and I don't know if, uh, Brian, if you wanna to add to that for the importance of the security um, for the facility. Um, yeah, so I mean, obviously the, the six foot fence that we're trying to put in is an industry standard and it's something that um, you know, BARDA Health and Human Services and, and the federal government have, have kind of 
stipulated as what the benchmark is uh, for security. But it, uh, so the fence, the, the fence height is is definitely a, a security must, and it's been echoed um, with those partnerships. But also, I, I want to express you know, how important it is for Catalent to present a very clean and uh, welcoming exterior and aesthetic, uh, because what we do is essentially uh, it's pharmaceuticals. You know, we we have to make sure that we you know present our exterior in a matter that is. Um, appealing to clients, appealing to employees and, and employee, you know, welfare at our site is, is incredibly important to us. And um, so that means security, but that also means a place that you want to work. And I think that Bill uh, and the rest of the team have done an absolutely amazing job, you know, to make sure that, you know, not just the fence, but the whole property line, the, the, the changes that we're doing in the parking lot are going to be an improvement uh, for both security and aesthetics, you know, we, we are planning on getting uh, more greenery into the area. I, I don't believe the shrubs are a problem at all. And I think, the, you know, we, we already have them in the works to be put in uh, to make it look better. So I, I, I full heartedly believe that that this fence is going to improve the property line and, you know, and, and make people really proud to to work here and for a company that's that's doing so much for this country and society in, in the form of, you know, vaccines and therapies and life-saving treatments. Thank you both. We are to the commission uh, for questions of the uh, petitioners or staff. Um, and I'll start off uh, for the petitioners, please. Could you uh, discuss how many entrances through the gate um, there will be, uh, pedestrian or vehicular, and how those will be handled? Um, let's see. Brian, do you want to do that? Or I didn't know if we included an exhibit. Um, yeah, maybe... there, there was a uh, an exhibit on the, the number of points of entry. A points so, of entry, OK. Yeah, there, um, there were at least, um, you know, so from Patterson, um, there's one main entrance uh, that we are definitely even opening as as our main entrance. There's there's a, a second entrance uh, that we planned to put a uh, slide. There's actually one that says the uh, the numbers on it, I believe. Um, yeah, there's one with the POEs marked, I think. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, there it okay. is. So, so PO, point oh, there we are. Two, okay. Point of entry number two is our main entrance, uh, which will be, you know, a, a gated entrance. Point, point of entry three as well. We're we're just we're actually doing a traffic study right now to to understand better what the flow is, uh, and what putting gates up here will potentially do uh, if we had to, you know, restrict the number of entrances to our site. Uh, what we don't want to do is, is back anything up onto the roads, uh, of course. So that's why we're doing the study is, as due diligence. Uh, I think that's prudent. Um, so point of entry number two will be the main entry from Patterson. Point of entry number four will be uh, another employee entrance um, off of uh, off a strong drive. Uh, and, and point of entry number three is kind of up for debate right now. But um, that's why we're doing the traffic study. The other entry points... Point of entry number one actually leads out to Rogers, uh, which is currently a gated entrance that has uh, uh, like chop arm style gates on it uh, to let employees into the side entrance. Uh, most of the other entrances, five through eight, are uh, commercial vehicles uh, coming off a strong drive. And actually point of entry eight is an exit only because uh, the traffic in the back, the loading, the loading and distribution goes clockwise through the site. So, yeah. and then I think six and seven are more, uh, let's see, no, five and six are more utility um, oriented for uh, waste, garbage pickup and that sort of thing. Yeah, and they're also, I think, uh, in below the, the northern face of the building, I, I, I don't know if they um, are applying to this uh, appeal or not, is that correct? That, yeah, that's correct, because I think anything south of the face of the building can be, okay. um, it is not a regulated fence height. Okay. So POE3 is the only area that may have um, some traffic uh, impact that you are currently assessing. 
Uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we're considering closing it. What we would not do is anything to back up traffic onto Patterson. So we're not looking into ideas of any type of stop and scan or any type of license plate recognition that would not go on that road as a safety precaution. Um, if that gate were to be open, it would just be open for a period of time uh, and not have to stop and wait for it to, to open. That's that's a decision process that we're reviewing, but uh, it's it's we're waiting for this traffic study to give us the, the data to make better decisions off of. Okay, thank you. Other questions? See none, then I will go to the public. Is anybody here this evening to speak to this petition? Don't see anybody and let me check Facebook again. Okay. And no one on Facebook. Okay, so then we are back to the petitioners for any uh, last comments. I just like to, um, to thank Eric for that great overview. You know, he's been a, a tremendous help and I, I thought that was absolutely awesome and went through everything point by point. So uh, thanks Eric and thanks Bill for, for helping out as well. Great. Thanks Eric, thank you Brian. So we are back to the commission for action. I'll move approval of E-24-20. Second. Second. And that's with the condition, right? Mm -hmm. As presented. And sorry, and based on the findings of that. Presented. Yeah. Uh, and Susan, you seconded? Yes, I did. Right. Okay. Any last comments before we vote? Yes, Susan. Yes, and I know this is not our purview here with the BZA, but I do wish you as much speed as possible with the vaccine work. Uh, I so appreciate all, all that Catalan is doing and has done for the community. And so uh, pleased to support this on your behalf and for your security. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. I'll be sure to relay that to our site leadership team. We appreciate everything you guys are doing too. Please do, thanks. I'd also like to note that I appreciate that you were um, willing to do some ornamental changes to the fence fabric for the areas that are closest to the road and uh, to public view. Yeah, absolutely. You know what, that, uh, that actually isn't any bother to us because I, I mentioned, you know, how important the aesthetics are. Um, actually, I'm sorry, Mr. Ford, this is, this is not a time for, um, for conversation. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Response. I apologize. Um, okay. Any, any other commissioners have comments before we vote? Okay, we are ready for a uh, vote, please. Great, Clapper, a yes vote is a yes. Uh, oh, thank you, Clapper. A, a yes is a yes in this one. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> Husky. Yes. Sandberg. Yes. Burrell. Yes. And Throckmorton. Yes. Five so zero. the petition is successful and um, thank you both very much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Okay. We are to V-25-20. Mark Hood and Christine Hack. Staff report when you are ready. You're muted, Eric. Thank you. I apologize about that. Uh, so I'll go back here. Uh, so this is a request uh, for a variance from front yard building setback standards to allow for a front loaded garage um, for the property at 2420 East Maxwell Drive. Uh, the property has been developed as a single family residence uh, and is surrounded by other single family residences. Uh, it has a driveway and front-loaded garage on the east side of the site uh, that extends closer to the street than the existing house. Uh, the UDO requires uh, that attached front-loaded garages must be 25 feet from the right-of-way or the uh, equal to the, uh, the building facade, whichever is greater. Um, so in this case here, uh, it would have to be even with the front of the houses to the west of this, or the, the west side of the house of the existing residence. 
Um, so as you can see, the existing garage extends uh, approximately 15 feet closer to the road uh, than the existing residential uh, wall. Uh, and so the, the property or the design of the building already does not meet um, current code. Um, so the petitioners would like to add on to the structure. It is a carport, um, which you can see on the left side of the screen here. Uh, it's an open carport. Um, so they would like to enclose that and make it a, an enclosed garage, but also extend it two feet closer to the road. Um, so as I just mentioned, the standards for the front loaded garage required to be uh, 25 feet or even with the building facade, whichever is greater, uh, the building facade on the west side of this building uh, would determine that setback. Um, so they, they would have to go even with that. And so the, the variance to allow for the addition would uh, basically be bringing the, the garage further uh, out of compliance. Um, so again, you can see here on the site plan, uh, the right side of the house, the east side of the house, the front loaded garage extends closer uh, than the existing wall of the building um, just to the west. Um, so this is the site plan for that uh, new garage area. Uh, as I mentioned, it would just be expanding uh, two feet further to the north um, and would allow for uh, an enclosed garage space. Um, so while staff did not find uh, any negative impacts uh, to adjacent properties or public health safety or moral uh, general welfare impacts, um, one of the, the third criteria uh, that the board is certainly aware of is that we must find that there is some unique condition, some peculiar condition about the property uh, that results in a practical difficulty uh, with the, the application of the zoning code. Um, so this particular lot, uh, it's, it's four times wider than what the minimum lot size is for this district. Uh, it's also substantially larger. Um, then the minimum lot size for this district. So it, it is not a, a small lot by any means. It is not narrow. Um, there is nothing unique about the property that does not allow them to meet code. Um, you know, it has an existing structure that doesn't meet code. Uh, we, we don't want a situation where something gets further from compliance. Um, and the intent of this was to not have front loaded garages that extend closer to the street than the existing residents. Um, and so, uh, you know, as I mentioned, that we, we do not find that there is any practical difficulty placed on the property by the denial of the variance. Um, so with that, we are recommending that the board deny the proposed variance. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Eric. Petitioner's representative. Hi, could you please state your name or names? Hi, everybody. Good to see everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Hood. And I'm Christine Hack. Uh, I'll do each, I'll swear you in each individually. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. And, um, and do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, thank you both. You have up to 20 minutes to present your petition. Okay, and I have a technical question first. Is it, am I allowed to uh, screen share at some point? Is that granted? Yes, I can do that. Hold on just a second. Okay. I'm not in a hurry. It'll come along later. It's a okay. surprise. I'll just, uh, yeah, you okay. should be able to at this point. Okay. I'll ask if it doesn't work. Great. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, hopefully we'll be nowhere near 20 minutes. Um, we worked hard to uh, crystallize our arguments and our uh, position in the written statement along with uh, pictures and other documents. But I realized that I'd left a few things out. So there's some rambling narrative to go here with some notes. So I apologize for looking up and down. Um, we've lived in this house and owned it for 17 years. And we love the neighborhood. We love the house. We love the garden very much in the yard. And we particularly love our unique block with its uh, big diversity of people and architectural styles and pedestrian life because it is a dead end street. It's everybody's shortcut to everywhere. Um, but mostly not cars. So uh, we like it here so much that we really intend to age in place here to the extent that it's possible, as long as possible, and have always felt that way. And to that end, we've worked uh, kind of constantly, expending a lot of time and money to maintain and improve the house um, to meet those goals over the last 17 years. So today's plan involves our 67 year old flat roofed carport, which is showing signs of uh, problems. 
It has a broken slab, it's a big crack in one corner, uh, and settling around the slab there. And the flat roof has now become concave, which is um, not a preferred design. Uh, mm -hmm. So it tends to collect water and become a lake, which um, aggravates the sagging because the extra weight of the water. So something needs to be done. Um, since we need to address it, and it will not be trivial, it will also be expensive to take care of all of this, um, we want to do it in a way that furthers our goals for this house and for our plans to stay here. So working over several years with um, Chris Floyd, uh, our designer, um, we've come up with a plan for to enclose the space of the carport, basically replace the carport because we have to replace the slab, but um, with a slightly enlarged footprint uh, enclosed garage. And the goals for that are to increase the security of the home. We have had a break in into the house itself through the carport. Um, and we also have had people come onto the carport and smash the windows of the cars looking for drugs, which they were sorely disappointed. But um, so we'd like to increase the security of the house. Um, we'd like to provide uh, options for future accessibility options, including possibly a ramp or a lift if necessary when needed for Chris and I as we age, but also Chris's parents who are both 86 like to come over a lot and they're getting to the point that they need accessibility options as well. We also want to provide additional storage for the nearby garden and the tools that address the maintenance of the front yard instead of having them all the way in the back of the yard and in the basement. Um, also our bikes and kayaks, which are getting pretty heavy to carry up the stairs or around the backyard. We also would like to improve the aesthetics of the structure, um, the street appeal that's very important to the neighborhood, but also to the uh, growth policies plan and the criteria of the variances. And all the time keeping it consistent with the character of the house and of the neighborhood. And to have a better fit in the neighborhood in the sense that we are the only house left that only has a carport. Every other house on the street has an enclosed garage. This would bring us closer to um, the look of the neighborhood without sacrificing the unique character of the house. Um, so th our main argument in this case is the UDO itself and the text contained therein that reading the UDO um, in a strict fashion, our garage is not front loading. There is no definition of front loading contained in the UDO, including the glossary at the end of the document that defines what front loading means. Um, our only clue is to the intent of the UDO in this particular situation are the illustrations that are included of um, idealized neighborhoods of the future where uh, in every case they show zero degree front loading garages with the garage door surface parallel to the street and the driveway perpendicular to the street as the entrance. That's all the clue we have from the UDO as to what a front loading garage is. Our carport slash hopefully garage is angled 30 degrees to the south away from the plane of the street. Um, and we find that this is a not a typical uh, design feature of houses of this era. This was designed and built in 1952-53. Um, it's a mid-century modern type of house and there are lots of examples, especially in our nearby Covenanter neighborhood, but other places in town as well too, where they've employed this non-right angle um, design feature for wings of the house, for carports, for garages, for entryways and things like that. Um, these were built for a reason. The 30 degree angle of the carport was not an accident. It wasn't drunk carpentry. It was designed that way for aesthetic purposes um, and practical purposes as well. So, in fact, the, the UDO has no definitions uh, other than the implied definition for front loading being zero degrees. There's no definition for our 30 degree carport for 45 degree, 60 degree, or there is even no definition for a 90 degree loading car, carport or garage, which is called side loading um, by the staff, but it's not in the document. There is no such definition. Um, our position is that 30 degrees is not equal to zero degrees, basically, and that 
if we can't rely on the text of the UDO as a guideline for design plans and enforcement, then that seems unfair, I guess. So that seems like a problem that the text doesn't support that. So um, our main position is that um, we are not non-conforming. The 30 degree angle to the carport in the garage is quite a bit different than a true zero degree front loading garage and carport. Um, and therefore, no variance is required. We are compliant. Um, okay, sorry, I need to look at my notes be before I go astray. Okay, I'm just gonna say, and our, our future garage would also be compliant under this interpretation. So I'm gonna attempt to start screen sharing now so I don't look so nervous. Wow, is that my screen? <laughs> um, let's try this. Does that look like a picture of our house? An aerial, yes. Yes, okay, thanks, sorry. I hadn't run across that screen before. Sure. Okay. Um, we have been in contact with the planning department uh, over a couple of years about this project um, to try and submit something that is compliant if it's possible to do, um, uh, even before the new UDO. And when staff came back to us saying, well, you've got a front loaded carport garage, um, so you're out of compliance, I did point out the 30 degree angle and some of the architectural justification for that. Um, and they responded basically that um, looks like a front loading carport to them. Um, and so I asked them what they were looking at and that possibly the street views from Google Maps and things weren't accurate enough and I hadn't sent them good pictures. And they replied that this is what they were looking at, that they looked at this aerial shot and said, yeah, looks like front loading to us. And we feel that's not enough of a basis that um, Mr. Grulick's comments um, throughout the process have uh, reinforced the idea that a lot of what's going on here is aesthetic choices, that the part of the zoning uh, intent is yes, public safety, yes, protection of property values, but really the look and the feel and the character of the neighborhood is an important feature of why these setbacks are established the way they are. So we felt that this wasn't the view to show, and that's why we submitted this picture. This is taken from the center of Maxwell Lane, pretty much on the midline of the house structure itself, looking left and right. And as you can see, the carport is presenting a large uh, face that is not the entry. And this is what it has in common with what's been termed 90 degree or side loaded garages. It presents a large face that is not the entry to the neighborhood as you approach. So I think there's a big difference between our point of view is that there's a big difference between this view and what a front loaded garage or carport would look like no matter what the setback. And this is um, a very amateur rendering of what this might look like if we go forward with our plans. The garage gets enclosed. It comes slightly closer to the street. It's two feet times the cosine of 30 degrees apparently, which is slightly less it gets a little bit taller and we're hoping to extend it about four feet to the east and that would still be within the setback allowance um, but because the whole structure is being enlarged uh, they are staff is opposed to uh, granting a variance letting us do this um, our contention that the 30 degree angle really does have quite a bit of aesthetic value be, uh, above um, a front loaded carport uh, for the street view point of view um, and has a lot in common with what a 90 degree side loaded garage would present. Um, if you look at it this way, the sight line of pedestrians and cars coming from the west is occluded to the point that you can't see the entrance to the carport or the garage until you are already in front of our property. From this point, 
to the west. Nobody can see the carport. They're just facing the wall of the garage, which is again, very similar to how side loaded 90 degree carports and garages are built. Um, this is where you should know your slides. So if we go out to this point in the middle of Maxwell Lane to see what a pedestrian or a car sees as it travels east, this is unfortunately from Google Maps. Um, so the, their fisheye camera is a little bit weird, but we are still in front of our property. We're east of the extension of the west property line, looking at the wall of the carport here and we cannot see the entrance to the garage or the carport at all. This would be very different if it truly were a front loaded carport or garage. And I blew it up just because it's hard to see from a distance, but you can't see the front entrance. The 30 degree angle of the carport slash garage has an aesthetic purpose and it has a practical purpose of improving the street view uh, much as other side loaded garages have. So one suggestion to come into compliance was that, oh, you can go ahead and build a compliant front loading garage, which means it would have to be in the plane of the bedroom wing of the house over here. But now the front of the garage is completely visible all the way to the west, ignoring the fact that there's a lot of shrubbery and landscaping. But the 30 degree angle really does improve the street view. It makes it different than the effect of a front loaded garage. Yep. So this is our goal. Um, and we, we would like to really, we think that if we're required to defend a strict interpretation of the UDO as part of the variance process, we also think it's fair that the strict literal reading of the UDO is used in defining what a front loaded garage or carport is. And we feel ours is not a front loaded garage or carport. So we're disagreeing with the finding that got us to the variance. And I don't know the procedure, so I'd sort of like to pause here to see um, is it what the legal procedure is here and what the options are for the BZA members. Um, is it possible to overturn the initial finding of staff that we have a front-loaded carport based on this argument? And if not, then I can proceed with um, some more comments on um, an appeal for a variance if a variance is needed. Our strongest point of view is that we don't need a variance. We are compliant based on a strict reading of the UDO. And I'll pause here and try and give my screen back. So Eric or Jackie, can you please respond to the question? Yes. Um, so what is, what is before the Board of Zoning Appeals tonight is a variance request um, to allow for a front-loaded garage. Um, as you guys are aware from the two previous petitions here, uh, the administrative appeal route is what somebody goes down if they don't agree with our interpretation. Um, so in this case, we made an interpretation that is a, a front-loaded garage. Um, so the petitioners should have filed an administrative appeal to that particular aspect um, if that's if that's what their belief is. Um, so here is a, a picture from Elevate of the front of the structure. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we looked at a, a general definition and you know, a general look. When you drive down the street, when you look at this from an aerial, is this a front-loaded garage or a side-loaded garage? And a, we do not have that term defined. However, when you go out there and you look at it, you see the entire front of the structure from the street. I don't, I don't think this is a point for making an argument. I think it's a question of what they should have done. Okay, so I think that's an answer. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. yeah, so we're clear just in terms of the procedure. Yes. Um, so I don't know. What the only is question though, Madam President, President, is can they, if they're denied this variance, can they come back and, and file? That's the only other legal question. Can they file an AA later? Let's, let's table that for a moment. Um, that, the, the petition asked for clarification. We granted that. I don't know how much time they have remaining um, for their presentation. Jackie? Or, or uh, They have about three minutes left. Three yeah. minutes, okay. Yeah. So if you would like to continue um, with your presentation with the answer to your question um, as, as received. Okay, um, so going to the uh, uh, 
proposed findings that Mr. Gerlich submitted in the uh, staff report. Um, obviously, there's no public danger. And in his second point about uh, better appearance um, from the road and possible negative impacts to property values, um, he, he suggested that there might be possible negative impacts. We disagree with that strongly. We think that the plans that we presented um, sort of counteract that uh, point of view that contradicts his proposed findings. And the neighbors and the butters, uh, butters all agree, and most of them have done it in me email, and some of those came in in time to be included in your packet. The neighbors like this plan. It'll look better, it'll improve their property values. Practical difficulties, um, it seems to be based on lot size, but our particular practical difficulty is the house and the garage and everything are already built. Um, so we have to deal with the house as a pre-existing condition to us. We can't build a front-loaded zero-degree garage without destroying our screened-in port in our garden. We can't and won't build a side-loaded 90-degree garage um, because it'll look terrible and it won't match the aesthetics of the house. And we'd have to turn our front yard into a driveway. So we are left with no other options. We do have practical difficulties that are peculiar to this particular house and this particular siding. Um, and we still maintain that it's not a front loading garage according to the strict definitions of the UDO. And that's our pre presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are to the commissioners for questions. Yes, Susan. Go ahead, Susan. I have a question about the, the existing structure and it's said that it's to be out of compliance. When the house was built and the structure was put in, was it out of compliance at that time uh, with the current carport? Uh, how, how was that approved to begin with? Just a different time in a different place? Than uh, it, exactly. So that the, the time that this house was constructed and the front loaded garage, uh, there was not a different setback uh, for front loaded garages. There was just one setback that applied and the house itself uh, met that setback. The 25 foot setback uh, for front loaded garage did not come into place until 2007. Um, so this was constructed uh, well before that. And so the current footprint that they want to build this, this more enclosed and more secure garage over uh, really is basically going to be in the same place as existing structure. Uh, as I said, it's a pre existing condition, and I kind of like that uh, depiction of it. Um, what are the objections aesthetically? Can, can you go back and revisit what the objections are to this term of front loading, which we seem to be having some uh, difference of, of interpretation about? Um, sure. So as I mentioned, the, the purpose of the setback requirement in the UDO for a 25 foot setback uh, for a front loaded garage was twofold. One, uh, the minimum distance of 25 feet was there to ensure that there is enough room between the house uh, and the property line to get at least a car in there so that you're not hanging out over the sidewalk. So that's, you know, a typical car is 20 feet long. Um, and so the 25 feet was there to ensure that you don't have a car hanging out over the sidewalk. Um, however, the other extent, um, which I mentioned earlier, was, was aesthetics, and that is to not have a front loaded garage extending closer than the house. Um, so these snout houses, as they're referred to as, um, you know, if you drive down a street, imagine driving down a street, and if the first thing you see at every single building is a house with a front loaded garage that sticks out first, that has a different visual impact than if you drive along that same street and you see the functional part of the house and the front loaded garage is set further back. Um, so that yeah, is- and, and I remember- I recall those uh, discussions about snout houses, but again, I'm kind of thinking about this is how the house was designed from the get-go, and uh, in order to replace it with actually a better looking structure um, at, at the angle that it is, it, it does not appear to me to be um, in violation um, as the uh, code was intended to to prevent, you know, things, eyesores or, or what have you from developing. But I know that's not what we're arguing here. We're, we, that would be some other um, uh, uh, case petition that they would bring forward if they wanted to um, 
I, and I'm trying to get clarification and I'm not really great at asking these questions being new, but uh, help me out here. Um, what are we going to be able to do? I'm somewhat sympathetic to this one in terms of, of um, giving them advice. Well, we would need to, we would need to uh, come up with alternative findings of fact that would support mm -hmm. uh, granting the variance. So we would need to look at what's been presented to us and understand uh, what about this circumstances, uh, what about this circumstance, and you've already brought forward that, that the house is existing, it has a particular angle to the existing carport. Um, we, ha we basically would have to devise alternative findings of fact, and so that we would begin to build build that evidence, build mm -hmm. those findings. Um, so let me just ask a, a question, um, just to further clarify. Uh, to the petitioners, can you can you talk a little bit about why you want this has to, why does this have to be two feet larger? Could you not do what you need to do in the existing footprint? Um, yes, and, and Mr. Grulick has pointed out that we're allowed to keep the existing footprint and if we want to enclose it as a garage, we have that by right. But we want to enlarge the garage for the goals that we listed earlier. And probably the main one there is to have room for an accessibility ramp um, for our future and for her parents present. Um, and that would be, uh, there are two options for that if we get the two feet um, to the Northeast. Um, either against the back wall of the garage so that there would be a way to go that way or along the uh, northwest wall of the garage, there would be a way to do a ramp there. Um, and the four feet to the west that we're, sorry, four feet extra to the east that we're requesting is really for um, storage and room and more utility to make it a more modern garage. This is a very small garage by modern standards. Again, it was built in 1952-53. Um, it would be a shame not to be able to improve that part of the house as much as we've improved the rest of the house. Okay, but Eric, just as a clarification, the only the only um, issue that we're looking at really is the depth. That's that the width is really not an issue here. It's really the it's the depth. Uh, yes, it's the it's the the distance between the front of the garage. Um, I mean, really, the front of the garage and the the house that is the building front facade. Okay. So, yeah, so it's not a width, but it's a, a le depth, a north to south issue. Mr. Hood, did you have something to add? Uh, I'd just like to say that in, in previous correspondence and conversations with planning staff, they also indicated that even enlarging it only to the east would be increasing the footprint of the existing non-compliant structure and they could not support it. Okay, okay, thank you. I just wanna make sure I understood that issue. Okay. Well, I have another question. Uh, if, this, if the carport was built in 1952, have the Historic Preservation Commission been able to look through this project? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, no, it, it, my, it has not gone through the demo delay uh, process. Correct, because if we, we, we might approve something here that will get denied by the Historic Preservation Commission. I, that's thank you, Flavia. That's an excellent question. Because do we know if they could even take down the existing carport? Um, yeah. So that that's that's an unknown. Um, you know, if we work with the Historic Preservation Commission and the scope of work is something that would require the HPC to review this, everything has to work concurrently. Um, so, you know, your granting of a variance doesn't necessarily mean that it meets any historical requirements or that it doesn't have to go through that process. That's a separate process. It stands alone by itself. Okay, thank you. Sometimes it's a little confusing what goes first, which track goes first. Yes, Susan. 
Um, do aging in place considerations have any merit or bearing on a request for a variance? Because that certainly speaks to me personally. I'm just, again, the newcomer here trying to get uh, uh, what we can and cannot do here with respect to uh, the appeal being made. Yeah, so um, so the, the petition that's before you for a variance, um, you know, the comp plan is not, the comp plan provides guide, broad guidance over the entire city as a whole. It is not a specific by uh, property by property um, recommendation, but something that, that we want everything within the community to try to accomplish. So the variance process, however, has a different scope of review in that how is this one property unique and doesn't allow it to meet code. So it has to come back to what is unique about this property, not necessarily the house, um, or you know a broader goal within the community, but what is unique about this specific property? Um, so uh, you know that's that's what is always hard and difficult about variance requests is it has to come back to that. You know. We, yeah, but I, I think Eric that you you've hit on it, and Susan, I was going to interject, which is aging in place is not a peculiar uh, circumstance. So. It, it doesn't apply. That would be the same as asking, do we consider how much it's going to cost to, to fix something or change something or whatever? That, those are also non-considerations because it's not a, that's not a peculiar circumstance. Eric? I, I do have a further question. Yes, please, Joe. Uh, so uh, this is uh, to, to, the, to the staff. Um, it, I think this goes at the heart of what the petitioner is asking, which is, is not the design of the house a peculiar circumstance, a, a, a peculiar condition um, because of the way it was purposely designed? So, so certainly it is unique to the property uh, that where the building is doesn't allow it to meet code. Um, however, you know, we have to look at what, what are we trying to accomplish with the setback if we want properties to come into compliance, if we want the, the building further back, is the denial of this going to take away the reasonable use uh, of the, the property uh, that relates in some practical difficulty? Um, you know, there are lots of properties that are built around Bloomington that were built prior to the current code, but when the codes change, we want them to come to compliance. We don't want things to get further from compliance. Um, so I, I, I know this is difficult. That may be parsed a little bit, I think there in the language Eric, because you know the the house is, is has a has a design and it was a purposeful design this it wasn't built on later um, and it was designed at the time when it was allowed and I guess I guess what I'm asking is they're not asking to make a substantial change they're asking to be able to to improve an existing design and my, my question is because of their point of the 30 degree angle which is not stipulated in code as being front facing this is an interpretation by the the city in my opinion so is that not a peculiar condition yes or no so so it's it's, it's hard to answer that with a yes or no because the the, their aspect, their question of, is this a front-loaded, and, and your question uh, of, is this a front-loaded garage, um, really is something that would be an administrative appeal that then the board could have more broader scope of making a decision on that aspect. And then that, that goes to my final question, Madam President, which is, let's say that if this, um, uh, if this variance is denied, are the owners allowed then to return and ask for uh, an administration appeal, or does the variance already override that? Uh, no, those are two separate things. Um, okay. So yes, they would be allowed to file a petition for an administrative appeal uh, to you know, discuss the specific aspect of, is this a front loaded or a side loaded? All right, thank you. Um, Eric, let me, ask, let me ask you a question. Uh, the nature of the street being a dead end street and the design uh, so that it's splayed away from incoming traffic, um, would, would, could those be construed as um, something that's specific to this 
property. You know, that was a response, uh, uh, an architectural response to to this to this condition of the one way. You know, not the it's not one way, obviously, but that it is a dead end street. It seems to me that um, that the architect did not point the garage to the to the west on purpose. They pointed it to the east. Um, so that it would obscure the car, um, which does kind of uh, speak to the whole purpose of the code to begin with, um, to try and mitigate what we consider less attractive, um, you know, front-facing garages that come at you. Yes, you, you could cite those as possible unique conditions, um, you know, if the board felt like that was appropriate in the direction that they wanted to go. Okay. Yes, Flavia. I, I still it, it thinks it's, we should not discard the historic value of this house. The, the mid-century home, mid-century ranch with a carport uh, that was built for a specific purpose. And when you when you cite that the architect decided to to um, um, you know hide the car, that was on purpose. That was specific to that era, to that time. Uh, so this uh, we can't call that a side loading garage, but it is an angled car garage, um, if you if you will, architecturally speaking. So um, in terms of pecu pe being peculiar, I think what you have peculiar about this property is the historic value of this architecture, if you will, and the carport goes with it. Susan? Are the other houses in the neighborhood similar in terms of the mid-century modern? Uh, and you say you're the only, I'm, I don't want to speak to the petitioner directly, but um, the uh, you're the only house in this cul-de-sac area that does not have an enclosed garage at this point. So my question might be, have those other houses been able to enclose their carports or um, are you just a singular house there on the block that uh, was built with the carport and not an enclosed garage? Can Is the petitioner a answer a question? At this? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, we are the only one that we know of that started with a carport. Uh, a couple of the houses originally did not have garages or carports. They were really tiny little cabins. Um, the closest thing to a similar mid-century modern house is directly across the street from us, um, where the entire structure of the house is at an angle to the street. It's a giant lot, but the closest thing to the street is the enclosed garage. Uh, which is also at an angle to the street and they're angled wings to that house. So um, on our particular block, I believe we are the only original carport and we are the only, still the only carport. Um, in the neighboring, uh, in my our written statement, I attached a bunch of pictures. They're unfortunately only aerial shots, but there are a bunch of streets, uh, sorry, a bunch of houses along Covenanter in particular that have very elegant carports from this era. Um, I suspect they might even be by the same architect, but I haven't had a time to dig through that and that probably wouldn't help my argument much anyways, but it is an interesting point. Hopefully that answered your question I got. Yes, okay. thank you. Um, uh, Eric, the, the original carport size, the depth of that is only 20 feet deep. We didn't see, there's no demo drawing, so I didn't know. Um, I, I don't have that information and in what I have submitted. The petitioners could certainly speak to that. Ms. Jod? Yeah, the depth of the slab is exactly 20 feet. 20 feet. Okay. Um, I would just, I was just thinking, you know, whether when we talk about um, typically uh, a a garage needs to be a bit deeper in order to to hold a modern car. They're larger than they were when in you know typically than when they were. Um, it depended on the car. <laughs> it, it goes both ways. So station wagons back back several decades were pretty long too. 
Um, so I was just wondering if there was a peculiar condition related to that potentially. Um, okay, uh, I have another question and this is a UDO question, Eric. Uh, until the UDO change, uh, was it not possible uh, to, what the language, it seems to me that the, the, the new UDO added the language about having to um, match the front face of the house um, or whatever is greater. Yes, yeah, so that, that came about with the new zoning code that was updated in April of this year. Okay, so prior to that, this would not have required a variance. Correct. Um, yes. Yeah, so prior to that, this wouldn't have required. However, you know, this is an indication that there was, you know, a clear change um, in the desire of the community to regulate these structures even further. Um, so that could go either way. Right. I wanted you to speak to that, actually, um, about the decision to make that change since I don't um, have any information. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so that was something that came out of the city council. Um, you know, that was a specific amendment, uh, that was brought, uh, I, I believe by council member Piedmont Smith, uh, to increase that setback and kind of citing aesthetics, uh, as the reason for that. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Yes, Susan. I, yeah, I'm grateful to have this opportunity now to serve on the BZA um, to see where some of the bugs from the UDO may be cropping up. And this just may be one of them. And that's that's an opinion. I will bow out now. Okay. Okay. Any other any further questions for the petitioners or um, or Eric at this point? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the public uh, for any comments. Do we have anybody here from the public this evening who'd like to speak to this petition? I don't see anyone. Does anybody else? No, I don't. I don't, I don't see anyone. And there's also no one on Facebook. Okay, thank you. So then uh, I don't know how much time the petitioners have remaining. Uh, they got about one minute. Okay, uh, so you have one minute. If you have any further uh, comments you'd like to add at this point. Um, one is a response earlier to uh, Mr. Throckmorton's question about um, support for aging in place. Um, aging in place and, and, and also preservation of interesting styles and quirkiness of neighborhoods is very much a part of the growth policies plan that spawned the UDO. So aging in place is a goal that I feel should be supported by the UDO and the BZA process. Um, so that was one comment. Um, the other is that I think this, even though it may not bear on the specific issue of peculiarity is, um, I think there's a, a big problem with the UDO not defining the angles of the garage and the approach. Um, and the big example is the 90 degree side loaded garages, which are being, um, have a completely much more generous setback requirement. They can be much closer to the street, even if they're way in front of the house. Um, and I think that that's a real inconsistency in the UDO. Um, it's affecting our neighborhood. We have a house being built uh, close to high street, but still in our block, that the front face of the garage is 38 feet closer to the street than the body of the house. So it is as snout nosed as you can possibly get. And that did not require a variance. So um, I think what we're asking for is very moderate and I guess I'll stop. Okay, thank you. So we are back to the board for action and I see Susan's hand. I was gonna say, I'd like to keep my streak alive. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> no, well, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna move it. I have a question. If that's all right, that's fine. Um, you know, this ahead. this business about this business about administrative, they would have an opportunity to come back. How long does that take, and how much more complicated is that to come back before with if we're able to craft some sort of um, uh, reasonable um, uh, conditions or variances here? Um, what is their recourse if we are? going to be forced just from you know um, uh, the UDO and what it says to deny the request tonight. I, I'm just interested in a recourse. 
Um, yeah, so to, to be honest, I don't, I don't have the 2021 schedule right in front of me, um, but they're probably looking at a month and a week or two um, before they could file an administrative appeal. Uh, I, I just don't know what that schedule is, uh, but it, it would be at least a month. Okay, thank you. With that, I'd like to make a motion to approve V-25-20, and that is uh, to uh, grant the petitioner a variance. Uh, you have to cite some findings. Um... Oh, I will also say uh, with the following uh, 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 peculiar conditions. Yes. Uh, it is a dead end street to which the 30 degree angle garage faces and the design and angle of the garage. I find those both to be peculiar conditions that we should take into consideration. So to state it more clearly, I move, uh, I have a motion for approval of B-25-20 with the two peculiar conditions of a 30 degree angle and design and uh, the location on a dead end street to which the 30 degree angle of the garage faces towards the dead end. Those are the two peculiar conditions. And can I- Second. Friendly, yep. second. You can, just, yeah, she can make an amendment. Well, frankly, just um, just to say that it um, that that the orientation of the of the existing garage minimizes the visual impact on the street. The reason they're actually up for the thirty degree, yes, yeah. and that that in that's, the, the, that's the point. Yes, that's the point. Yes. So, do you want me to refashion it and say it again, or Eric, do you need him to to? Or can we just say include? That? Um, we'll, we'll need to write something up, so you do not have to state it here, but in your findings of fact, uh, that will need to be written up. Okay. And just to reinforce what Barry said, which is, it, it is the issue of the aesthetic design exists in a way that the front of that carport and soon to be possibly enclosed garage faces away from uh, the um, the entrance of the street and towards the dead end street. So it is already mitigated. So I wanna just reinforce that that's what you're saying there. The aesthetic design, I feel, uh, meets what it is that the UDO is trying to do. And then I'll have comments in the comment section. Are you going to add anything about the historic value of this design? Well, I, I think by stating the, the design, by including that in the unique, it's a 30 degree and talking about the design of the building. I think that that is, is implied in there without actually calling out historical, but we could certainly add that if you'd like. Well, Slavi, do you wanna add some additional language uh, or voice? Because it is, a, it, it is a matter yeah. of historic style. Yes, it is a historic mid-century style with an angled garage. So the historic, design, I, the 30, degree, the 30 degree angle of the garage, and the aesthetic design, which is part of the historical design, and the nature of the dead end street. I also want to note that it appears that we need to address um, number two as well, not just the peculiar condition, uh, but also the uh, adjacent property. And I think that what we're saying does address that also, but I just, in case we need to be specific about that. Yeah. Uh, so let's see if this will if this will work. A motion for approval of V-25-20 with the following peculiar conditions found that the building is of a significant historical design. But it is a mid-century modern design with a, with a splayed garage. Okay, a 30 degree angle garage. Mm -hmm. um, you, we just, you just included in the aesthetic design, Barry, thank you. And uh, the nature of its configuration towards the dead end street. So those three findings, historical design as you outlined, the, the mid-century. Mid-century mo modern. Yeah. So we can fashion a, a, a finding in, in such a manner that would be an agreement with the, with the commissioners. So we're saying uh, board, board it's peculiar and that it does not affect um, adjacent property in, in an adverse manner. 
Well, we're, that, we're, we're that, looking that, of at course, number three. We're looking at proposed finding number three. We have to provide an alternate. The strict application, there is no, the use and value of the area, number two, is not a, in question. Right. So, the staff that, made a know, negative know. finding for another two, number two. So Cassandra's just stating that you need to make a different finding because the staff's finding was a negative one. Oh, um, you're saying it because it's going to be Yep. So the 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 aspect of this that the orientation faces a dead end street does um, address condition two in relation to the use and value of the adjacent area because it it's facing the end of the dead end street. So the majority of the public view is not of the garage space. So that that does uh, address number two. Okay. Madam President, I see you making notes. Are you trying to get something that makes sense? No, no, no. I'm, I th we'll, we'll, wor we'll wordsmith it at the end. I mean, I think we all understand kind of the, the idea. They're, here. they're basically for the for the, for the third design, finding. angle of the garage and the facing of the road, uh, plus the idea that the expansion is not going to uh, actually uh, the, the, the taking it out of further compliance is not going to be an adverse uh, effect. Right. Okay. And do those, do, yeah. Do the letters from the neighbors uh, bear that out, or does that have any bearing at all? Being being in support of this and not being a negativity to the to the neighborhood. Well, um, there's no certainly injury. there's something you can reference. Yes. Yeah, it it supports that there's no injury to the adjacent property owners. So is this ready for a second? That you're saying lenders. <laughs> yes, it is. I think ready for a second. I think we have enough uh, uh, finding. Okay. I'll second. For a second. <laughs> Susan. Right. Pardon me. Any oh, Sandra seconded it. Who, pardon. Sandra. Oh, Sandra seconded. Thank you, Sandra. Um. Any further discussion? Well, I, let me just jump in because I said there'll be further. I, I, I agree, I think, across the board with what we're developing as additional findings. This is a, an interesting situation. On the, on the one hand, what I find against the petitioner is this idea that they can effectively have a, an enclosed, safer garage by just simply enclosing it. So that, that's an argument against um, supporting this, this uh, request for a variance. They can actually achieve a major part of what they want to do just by simply enclosing it without in increasing the site. However, that I, I do agree that the, the historical significance, the design of the house, the unique situation that it's it's on a dead end street. Uh, there are so many things there that the petitioner was very clear about showing how aesthetically um, it meets what the UDO is trying to do. And I think that they have a very valid argument that it is at an angle and it is not it is not easily defined as a front facing um, garage door. And that's why I was a little uh, kind of short of saying yes or no, is it, is it a front facing or not? The very fact that, our, that the staff cannot say emphatically, it is absolutely uh, uh, front facing. That's, that's the reason why I think that we need to grant this variance. I think that there's enough of a question and enough other uh, 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 evidence in our findings that would allow this to, this variance to be granted. I think it's quite reasonable. I, I want to say for me, I think the fact that it's in a dead end street and the orientation of this garage is, is for me what the unique circumstance is for this property. Um, it's interesting to think about the historic nature of it because Obviously, we understand the design intent and the owners in their design of the new garage are wanting to, um, to honor that original design intent. From putting my, um, my, uh, my historic preservation hat on, however, um, what the owners are doing is, is basically just demolishing an existing garage or the, the original garage, which is, which is the historic the actual historic part of the house. So from a, from a historic 
it's it's interesting because from a historic preservationist point of view, what's important is actually that material. It is original to the house, and and so um, I. I well, I understand the the architectural argument and honoring the the original idea that of how it's configured um, from a strictly preservationist point of view, uh, where the owner is going to be taking down the original carport and replacing it. So uh, it's for me, it's not a necessarily a clear cut um, case. I, I do on on the his, on the historic side of it. Um, I think that when I when I think of the orientation of the garage and the impact that it has um, for people on the street, I do really think that there is a unique situation there. For 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 that reason, I feel like I feel like this um, the variance and um, the fact that it's two feet, not ten feet, um, also. Um, makes a difference. It's a it's a pretty small um, a, amount that makes the the um, the garage more practical, so more meaningful. Any other comments or thoughts? Okay, I guess we're ready to call question call to question then. Please. Uh, Vote, please. Uh, so the motion that is on the table from uh, Mr. Throckmorton is to approve the petition um, with the findings that the, the, the board has kind of discussed here. Um, so I'll start with Mr. Throckmorton. Uh, yes. Uh, Mrs. Sandberg? Yes. Husky? Yes. Burrell? Yes. Clapper? Yes. Okay, the variance is approved. Good luck. And uh, thank you. And we will have to uh, work afterwards to finalize that language. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll write that up and we'll send that to you, Barry, to review uh, when we send the findings form for your signature. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay. We are on to our last case of the evening. Is everybody okay without a break? I don't know what time it is. Oh my, it's almost eight o'clock. <laughs> Does anybody need a break? We okay? I'm oh, good. Coasting through? Okay. We are on to V-26-20, uh, ACE-318 LLC. Staff report, please. All right, thank you, sorry. Um, this uh, this petition's for the property located at uh, 318 East 3rd Street. Uh, it's, that's the Southwest corner of 3rd and Grant. The property is zoned mixed use downtown uh, and it's within the downtown edges overlay character overlay. Um, the properties to the North, uh, West and East are all in the same district. The property directly to the South is in the RH uh, residential high density um, district. Uh, the property received a site plan approval for a mixed use uh, development in 2017. Um, the petitioner is requesting to uh, receive a variance to allow ground floor dwelling units to not be located 20 feet behind the building uh, facade, a front facing building facade. Um, when the development received uh, site plan approval, the UDO required a minimum of 50% of the first floor be utilized for non-residential uses. Uh, however, the plan commission was uh, allowed a deviation from that standard and this development received the site plan approval, uh, which allowed for a minimum of roughly 10% uh, of the proposed uh, 7,300 square foot ground floor. So it came out to be about 757 square feet to be used for um, any permitted non-residential use. Uh, the petitioner would like to convert the uh, 757 square feet of that non-residential space um, that was allowed by, again, by plan commission to be um, non-residential. They would uh, like for it to become a residential unit. Uh, that would mean the entirety of the ground floor uh, is residential and the 20 feet behind rule would not be met. 
the uh, petitioners requesting a variance from the UDO requirement for brown door floor residential units to meet that 20 feet uh, setback from uh, behind a built front building um, facade to allow for the conversion of the residential or the uh, non-residential unit. Uh, so uh, with that, the recommendation, uh, um, there's no injury found with the requested variance from the standard, which requires the dwelling uh, units be in the MDP zoning district, be located at least 20 feet behind uh, the front building facade. Uh, the use and value of the area um, in adjacent properties uh, is not ex expected to be substantially affected as a result of this requested variance. And then uh, there are no practical difficulties found in the results of a peculiar condition on the property. The property underwent site plan approval in 2017 and plan commission allowed for a reduction of non-residential ground floor space from the required 50% to again, roughly 10%. Surrounding properties to the east and west uh, support commercial uses and the, the site previously supported a commercial use um, with no known difficulties resulting from the, the property itself. The uh, intent of the regulation was to limit the presence, presence of ground floor residential units in the front of buildings facing public streets and to promote non-residential uses along ground floors of buildings facing public roads within the downtown. Um, this is a, a kind of a reminder from last time uh, when we had a similar case, just uh, that the department is in fact working on a text amendment to the UDO, which would allow for some flexibility in first floor um, space to, um, uh, because of the strain on commercial spaces due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, however, uh, the pandemic is not unique to the property and the uh, variance again is not um, currently, or uh, the, the uh, language is not currently uh, in the code. So with that, the uh, department recommends that the Board of Zoning Appeals adopt the proposed findings and deny V2620. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, petitioner's representative. Hi, um, my name is Tim Cover with Studio 3 Design, just representing uh, the petitioner, Ace, uh, on this uh, particular request. Thank you. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, you have up to 20 minutes to state your case. Great. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Ryan, for running through everything. Um, I know it's been a long evening for everybody, so I'll try and uh, run through it quickly and, um, you know, save the best for last year. So uh, this uh, particular variance, uh, again, is to allow a residential unit, which is an allowed use uh, to be on or front on Third Street in alignment with the two other units that are uh, currently approved uh, on the site. Uh, we are talking just from a scale standpoint, uh, the 757 square feet, uh, it represents 27 feet of frontage along Third Street. Uh, the current uh, Third Street elevation has two other units along Third Street that are full ADA uh, units. That was uh, unique uh, for this location. Uh, we are proposing a third unit uh, that would be in full compliance with uh, all fair housing requirements uh, at this location and be a two bedroom, uh, which is you know, adding to the mix, I guess, that would be allowed or available in the area. Uh, staff uh, went through and gave their uh, recommendations. Uh, as you know or are aware, under uh, a variance, there are basically three criteria that are being uh, weighed against. The uh, first one on approval uh, is not going to be injurious to public health or safety. Uh, staff did agree that there is no problem there. Uh, the second finding or, or uh, item to be considered, the use and value of the areas adjacent to the property will not be affected in a substantial manner. Uh, staff agreed uh, that there, again, was not a problem there. Uh, but the third item, uh, looking for a peculiar uh, peculiarity to this particular site uh, in question, uh, 
that had a practical difficulty. Uh, staff disagreed. They uh, did note, uh, I will say, kind of in general, four items. Uh, one was that the city had previously granted a reduction uh, in the amount of retail at this location from 50% to 10%. Um, on one hand, I, I don't know that that's really relevant to the question at hand that was in 2017, well, under different uh, UDO. Uh, but just to be clear, that wasn't a give me uh, at the time. Uh, the owner committed to $150,000 to the affordable housing fund, and that was roughly $30,000 over similar ask. Uh, we provided solar array on the roof for the project, uh, provided bus passes for every resident, as well as 100% uh, of the bike parking on site uh, covered and long term. Uh, the second item that was presented was that uh, commercial retail uh, existed at this site uh, without known issues. Uh, it is correct that retail had existed at this site. Uh, a letter was sent, and I apologize, it came after the packet went out. I can share my screen on the letter or paraphrase either, either one. Uh, from the previous owner of the site who owned the property from 2004 until 2019 when it was sold to ACE LLC. Uh, basically, uh, this from Mike Brahms. Um, let's see, do I have the ability to share? I'll go ahead and throw the, uh, the letter up here, kind of throw that in the middle here and enlarge a little bit. And now yeah. I'm not sure, are you getting the screen on there? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Um, basically, I'll just, I'll read, it's a short letter. Uh, my name. We do see it, Tim. You do see it? Okay. So basically, uh, Mike is just uh, pointing out that he was a previous owner. Uh, he had extreme challenges in leasing commercial space at, the lo at this location. Uh, shortly after purchasing the property, uh, the original tenant vacated. That was Wood, uh, Woodward Insurance. Uh, a radio station uh, took part of that space. The radio station then vacated in 2011. Uh, since that point, uh, basically the space set empty that he was trying to rent, except for during election season. He was able to get short-term leases in and out of there. So his bottom statement, basically that while it may seem to the outside observer that leasing commercial space at this location would be an attractive proposition, I can tell you uh, from firsthand experience, nothing can be further from the truth. Uh, he can't speak to the market uh, today since he sold the property, but he can say with confidence that during the time period, the 15 years that he owned the property, leasing commercial space uh, was uh, to a viable credit worthy uh, tenant was very difficult, if not impossible. Um, so just wanted to share that uh, letter with you. And then I'm gonna kind of switch this off in case there's something else you'd rather uh, bring up. And so that was uh, as far as uh, commercial retail, uh, Basically, the, the location has had difficulty, uh, especially from 2011 to present, prior COVID um, with leasing space. From a practical difficulty standpoint, um, unlike nearby spaces, uh, there is no parking for retail associated with this location. Um, Third Street does not have parking. Grant Street is uh, permit parking. As a you know, 750 square foot location, uh, 
you're talking about an office user. Uh, you're not really going to with that or a very small retailer, but again, you don't have parking uh, to support it. There is unfortunately uh, currently close to 56,000 gross square feet of retail uh, available. There's a, an attachment in your packet that just shows all the properties from the uh, retail listings in the uh, immediate area. And so you're talking about a, a small space competing against a lot of uh, existing established retail space that uh, has a very limited market that it would attract in the first place. And then it also has no parking and it has limited uh, pedestrian traffic at that location. So uh, again, from a procure, uh, particular difficulty, uh, again, you're talking about small space, you're talking about 27 feet along Third Street and it is, uh, again, as I said, pretty limited in terms of who you're going to even be able to get to fill that space if we weren't dealing with the current environment. As far as COVID is concerned, it is not unique uh, to COVID. Um, obviously, everyone is suffering as a result of what's going on. Uh, and unfortunately, I think the retail uh, problems that we are seeing and the, especially in office space, people are finding it's, you know, viable to work from home. And so small offices are particularly um, finding that's an easy solution. Why pay rent? Uh, we're going to work from home and save the money. Uh, so what's unique from a COVID standpoint here, again, is just the, uh, the size of the space the fact that you are trying to bring this small space to market at a time when there is no market. Um, and the reality is once we get a vaccine, it's not gonna be a throw the light switch on and all of a sudden retail is filling up. Um, it's gonna be a slow process. So you're talking about a, a storefront 27 feet of storefront that's going to sit dark as opposed to having the opportunity to um, be used and uh, provide some life on that corner. So I uh, appreciate your consideration of the uh, request and I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we, are, we are back to the commission for uh, questions of the staff or the petitioner. Yes, Susan. Is the concern that once this may get an approval to be converted to residential, which would be ADA compliant residential, that then in the future, if, if, if circumstances do change, it cannot then be converted back to the required retail space that would suit the UDO? Is, is that, that the primary objection? Uh, so no, the the primary objection isn't that it can't be reverted back. It's just that the allowance of ground floor wa wasn't the intent of the um, uh, MD district. So okay. uh, just allowing it uh, even even for a short period of time may may. And uh, I, I may have back. missed it, but um, the explanation that COVID is not a peculiarity of our times that can that cannot be used in this case. Uh, it's not that it's not peculiar to the times. It's pe not peculiar to this location. Uh, COVID is in fact, uh, uh, in, uh, has an influence on every inch of Bloomington. So not just this particular location. Um, the, the rule is looking for something peculiar about this location, uh, this property. Okay, thank you. Yes, Cassandra. Thanks, Ryan. I know that... Uh... Stick with me here for a second. I understand that some of this may not be relevant, but um, I'm going somewhere else with it. In 2017, when, the, when this was approved originally, do we know, was that 10% left specifically because it was going to be used by the owner? Would it otherwise have been allowed to be converted to residential? 
Uh, no, so they, they just offered that up. Um, it could have been used for any allowed use, uh, not just because they were allowing it for the, or the owner had uh, intended to move into that space. Okay. I think I may have phrased it in, I mean, poorly. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is, would they have allowed 100% of that ground floor use as residential? It's just that the owner decided he wanted 10% of it for his own office. Um, they could have if they, yes, they, if that was something the plan commission wanted to uh, grant a waiver for that would have been allowed um, at the time. Okay. I'll come back to something in a minute. Thank you. Other questions? Well, I, I think I need clarification on what Ryan just said. You're saying they could have allowed it. Were they asked to allow for the for the full use as residential and said no? Or are you saying that it was never requested? It, it was never requested, yes, sorry. Um, and, it and you're that. further saying that if it had been requested, that they would have been granted or that they could have been granted? Could have been granted. Thank you. Not, not, yes, sorry. Ryan, could, could you please uh, explain uh, the process by which the 50% went to the 10% originally uh, when that approval came through plan commission, sort of how that was done? Uh, so there, there was previously, um, there was a, a process um, in which um, plan commission had the ability to make adjustments or, or waivers um, to, to site plans to allow things outside of uh, um, st strict application, um, you know, so that you could have a buy right, but then you, there was also modifications that could be made. And so uh, one of the things they proposed to do was, um, as Tim mentioned, the affordable housing um, uh, addition um, to that fund and, and um, other, uh, the ADA um, use for the other two units. So, um, so things like that, uh, they would be allowed to, to make uh, adjustments. Okay. Um could you just speak a little bit to the importance that the city and the code has placed on having ground floor commercial and uh, why we have that at all? <laughs> so, yeah, there's there's a lot of reasons why it's uh, why we have it, uh, especially in the downtown. Um, the big one is generally walkability. Um, areas that have a public facing um, commercial spaces, um, they have larger windows. Um, there's things to look at. Um, it, promotes uh, safety because there are more eyes on the street at the street level, things like that, uh, it slows down traffic. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a safety thing for walking. Um, it, you know, like I said, it slows down traffic. Um, it's also just the downtown is where uh, commercials uses are. Um, so it, it, you, know, you want to have commercial use uh, facing the street. Right. You know, th that's the, the, the idea generally. The commercial, uh... I mean, this has been established in the downtown area. You know, it's not something new. Um, and uh, most of the, the multi-residential uh, places uh, are requested to have uh, uh, commercial spaces in the front, in the first floor. And if they have any uh, residential, it has to be 20 feet from the front. So you can have residential in the back of the building uh, if you need to. Uh, so it looks like when they got approval that they got away from the 50% of commercial space in the front in the first floor with 10% because they donated, uh, they had some dealings with uh, uh, affordable housing and uh, uh, he explained also the solar panels and uh, you know bicycles and different things that he did that they did, so they already got a waiver to have ten, only 10% of a commercial uh, space uh, in, because they, have, they already have um, two residential apartments facing the front and the first floor. So they're asking to get rid of all the commercial on the first floor. Uh, and I think that's what we need to look at um, because, um, uh, this has been decided by the UDO that we need commercial spaces. Now, 
there are talks that they're going to be looking into changing and giving different amendments, making amendments to the UDO to that effect. Uh, but we don't have those amendments done yet. So. I'm sorry to jump in, but this is more of a comment section than it is the questions for the petitioner staff. Is that right? Should we be having that discussion? Yeah, I, I suppose so. Yeah, we. If, if there's a, if there's a question there, Flavia. I guess my question is why are they asking for that when they are already granted? Um, you know, this building has been granted more than. Uh, granted more leniency, they only have 10% of commercial space on the first floor and now they're requesting to get, to get rid of it, basically. Um, is, and I'm sorry, is that for me to answer? Is that for the petitioner? Yes. Okay, uh, so a couple, couple items. Um, uh, number one, uh, this owner, uh, the current owner, Ace, uh, purchased the building and the and the project uh, from the previous owner Mike Brahms in 2019. So all of the approvals that happened uh, and the request to uh, go from 50% to 10% occurred uh, with a different owner. And so now that uh, Ace LLC is the current owner. Uh, they inherited uh, all of the requests or all of the agreements, which included the donation to the housing fund and the solar and everything else. So they are staying in compliance and um, honoring all the things that were agreed to originally. Uh, but what they are finding is, all right, we have a very small piece of retail that was left under the original agreement for that owner to move into and use as his office space. And that's the amount of space he deemed or felt he needed. Um, he has no interest in being there now. He's sold the building. Um, so you have a new owner with a small piece of retail space, office space that, uh, you know, on one hand is in an environment that I understand is affecting everyone and agree with, uh, but on the other hand is uh, very much uh, geared towards a small, very small tenant. And you are at a location where there's no parking for uh, commercial, there's no parking required for commercial in, the, in this location, uh, but there's also no street parking available for commercial at that corner. So with the amount of retail that is also available in the area for lease that has parking and that has other established um, retail establishments that will drive cross traffic, uh, somebody coming to look for a space has a lot of locations to choose from and what is I guess peculiar to this location more than anything is going to be the size and the uh, lack of parking that's available for it to help support getting somebody in there. Uh, the end result is we can, we can have that safety and have that life at that corner by having somebody living there, or we can uh, realistically have a dark storefront um, for an unknown period of time. I hope that answers uh, answers your question. One more question for the petitioner. I had to lock the door. Um, I'm looking at your uh, your plan here, and it appears as though the front entrance to the would be unit uh, is off of the sidewalk there on Third Street, and then there are no windows. Is that correct? Uh, that is not correct. Uh, the and I apologize for not having a, a elevation in that packet. Uh, it would be, it still will remain as all glass around that corner, and that corner oh. is all living space, uh, the living room, kitchen space, 
uh, and then going down Grant Street, it would also still be more storefront glazing. So we're not going to wall it up or, or close it off. Um, realistically, will somebody pull their blinds uh, at, you know, times of the day? Absolutely. It's, you know, they're living in there. But the, as a, even a retail space, this is raised um, slightly from the street level. And uh, you do go under a, a kind of a covered area on that corner to come into the space. So uh, in terms of, I'll say safety again, if it is an empty space, um, hanging out under the overhang there uh, is, probably inviting to uh, individuals that, you know, don't have a, any place else to go that might want to just kind of hang out and cause more safety issues. Can we get a street view? Anybody? Hey, sorry, I'm working on it. I, I think yep. Eric's got it. Ryan, so, as you're showing, Ryan, as you're showing this, I'm going to ask a question. So this is currently in construction, correct? Yes, it's currently. Uh, the building's okay. demolished at this point. The, the this building is gone, and and they're working on um, making a new building. So I'm a little confused. This building does not exist yet, but they're bringing. This is. The request is being made because of the coronavirus conditions. No. Um, so, so it's a, it's it's really not about that so much. No, the um, the coronavirus. Uh, I just brought that into the mix because it's listed as a reason. Mr. Cover, um, the question was for Ryan. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so yeah. It, Tim answered it, but it's not directly related. Uh, it was brought up, um, at, at, you know, but it it was not this specific. Um, it's point. not specific it, to the. Correct. Okay. Okay. So the building hasn't been built, and we already know that the commercial space is not going to be rented. Is this a, who is this a question for, Flavia? Not for Tim, uh, okay. Mr. Clover. I think the practicality of the space getting rented in the future is considered uh, by the owner to be slim uh, based on the amount of retail space, based on all of their current holdings and the difficulty they're having with finding retailers. Um, and then again, the size and the lack of uh, parking. It was not purpose built by this owner. Um, He's inherited the situation, and the request is more that that small bit of retail is is just not a viable amount of retail to attract a tenant. Um, Ryan, can you please um, show the floor plan, the proposed floor plan with the unit? And is there an elevation we can see? I know there's not one in the packet. Do you? Does anybody else have one? Of what? Elevation or front elevation? Uh, I do not have a proposed elevation of the the, or the elevation of the proposed plan. Okay. Um, but, let me see if I can. Can you can you share the plan? Um, because I can't. Oh, is it not showing? On this. I, yeah, I can't get to. Hang on, sorry. I thought I was sharing it. That's okay. Try this again. Mm -hmm. Is that better? Okay. Great. So it's unit B1, the corner unit. Correct. So I, I do have to ask a question. I think that was, if I may bear, are you asking a question or are you just looking at- No, that was, I just wanted, I asked him, please put that up. I, I guess a, a question that comes out of the, the response from Tim just now is so you're asking for this variance in order for a person who bought a building 
decides he can't make as much money or possibly could lose money based on a poor decision to purchase is is it fair to to be left with that impression based on your last response tim um no i don't know that it's uh, so much a poor decision to purchase i think it's just simply it's a you you bought this building the 700 square feet um isn't isn't what is you know in fairness what is going to make or break uh the viability of the building it's just whether you have a space that's sitting vacant or you have a space that's being used thank you okay. and i can share an elevation with you if you'd like to see what this will will be that would be great thank you okay since it was requested by Cassandra. Okay. Uh, so elevation up. Yeah. So uh, I'm sorry, are you seeing the elevation? We are. Okay. So the area in question is behind uh, these uh, columns here. It's this glass uh, storefront zone through here and here. Can I ask so, you based on that? Because that street on the left where it says 318, that's the side street, correct? Could, this this is Grant Street Brian, here. Can you put that street view back up. Is it is it possible to see that street? Yeah. Hang My on, question then becomes there you go. where that car is parked on the right and yes. all of those spaces in front, are those leased or are those public spaces that could be used for commercial? It's uh, permit parking. That's all permit parking there? Down through the street here okay. on just this side. Yeah, so on Grant Street there on the west side there mm -hmm. where that blue car is, none of that can be used for, for commercial retail shopping. That is my understanding. Thank you. I should ask the, the, the staff, is that correct? I believe that is correct, yes. Yeah, it looks like it's a neighborhood uh, yeah. permit zone. Okay, thank you. Yep. And uh, may I ask a question about the parking? Is not is there not any designated parking on in their parking structure of the building? Because they have they have parking in the building. Is that for me? Uh, yes. Petitioner. Um, yes, please. Uh, the the answer is no. There is no designated commercial parking. The re since we are next to a residential area, the residential parking requirement was even greater than what we could fit on site, and so there is um, as part of the original uh, petition. Four, four additional spaces that had to be purchased at a lot off-site uh, just to meet the residential need or requirement, I'm sorry. Any further questions for the petitioner or staff at this point? I have one more question for the petitioner. Yes. And I don't know how practical this is because I'm assuming you'd have to go back in front of planning again, but to change the exterior design of that unit such that it appears to be a residential unit and not you know, a glass plated commercial unit. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, we would be open to that. Uh, I think that again becomes whether that would put us back into planned commission or if that would be a staff level type of discussion. And I only say that because uh, uh, each each version opens a new can of worms. <laughs> yeah, so Cassandra, they, they would basically need to stick to the elevations that were shown and approved. Uh, it, it really depends on what they're proposing, but since this was approved under the old code, they're, they're really stuck with what was shown and approved. 
Um, so the, the small signs of the commercial space was something that they chose. This was, this was a self-induced hardship on their, their perspective. Same thing with the parking spaces that are in the garage. They could have designated some of those for commercial. They didn't have to build all the residential units that they were proposing here. Um, so a lot of these conditions they're citing are self-induced hardships. Any further questions? Then we are to the public for comment. Uh, is there anyone here tonight who would like to speak to this petition? I'm not seeing anyone on Facebook. I don't see anybody here. Okay. Uh, Seeing none, we are back to the petitioner for final comments. Um, is there time remaining? Yes, yes, nine minutes. Uh, um, <clears throat> well, uh, basically, again, I'll, I'll just say thank you for considering the uh, petition. Uh, Brian, thank you for uh, preparing all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clover. We are back to the uh, commission for action. Um, I, I just wanna uh, say um, to start off the conversation anyhow, that I think one of the difficulties with the commercial building, with the buildings, the mixed use buildings, having um, a commercial facade and slipping a residential use behind is that they're, they're big privacy issues and it's not a desirable circumstance. That's why I really appreciate that the two original units that were designed have more punched openings. They're articulated differently. They will function much better. People will feel much more comfortable living in that unit adjacent to a fairly busy street, busy for Bloomington anyhow, Third Street. Um, so there's really a conflict with all that glass and a residential use, um, being that it's, you know, it's not elevated, there's no separation for privacy. So um, given the architecture that we have um, and the fact that the building isn't completed yet and, um, and really there, there has not been an attempt or there can't be an attempt until, that, until the building's there for that space to be leased potentially. Um, this to me seems, um, I don't know, premature. And so I move denial of V-26-20. I second. Okay, and can you just state what the, um, could you more fully state? You said deny, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, maybe denial. I couldn't I'm hear you. I'm saying that we do not grant the variance. Okay, just denial. Uh, okay, no, I couldn't, I'm sorry, I could not hear you. I, 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 that, thank you. And okay. the reason I'm, I'm saying that are threefold. Um, the, uh, the petitioner, they have overbuilt the residence for that location with, with what they've said, they have inadequate parking even for the amount of residence that they have. They didn't uh, provide for any parking for what was designated already as a as an office space or a, a commercial retail. Um, and the other point that I'll make is as a small uh, business owner myself who is in the downtown area, I spent a good six to eight months looking for a space that was exactly this size at the right at the right uh, uh, lease rate uh, in the downtown area. Uh, there is actually, in my opinion, uh, based on my experience, there is a lack of this type of space for business owners like myself who need a smaller space. Um, and so I agree with what the UDO is trying to do in order to provide these spaces. Uh, the question then becomes, is it rentable based on the, the cost? But that's another issue. But this space is eminently usable. And we have witnessed that all the way down Third Street with similar spaces all the way back towards um, Walnut on that street. So that's why I'm, I'm, I've made this motion. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, I have some comments. Um, I do think that the 20 foot uh, rule is, is a good rule and that uh, we don't want residential right on the street, especially with a lot of visibility. Um, 
I also agree with the petitioner with regard to being able to rent that space, having been in real estate, both valuation and on the sales side. Uh, yeah, that's going to be hard to rent a standalone building, a uh, small square footage like that. Uh, so I understand that. Um, and originally when I was looking at the case, I was thinking this could be built as completely residential, but now that I see that it already has a commercial unit planned, something that's designed as a commercial unit um, that can't afford the kind of protections uh, that we try to put in place with the 20 foot rule, then I would have to agree to deny it. Any further thoughts? If, if not, we're ready for a vote. Um, so I just want to make clear that, uh, Joe, your motion is to adopt staff's proposed findings uh, and deny this petition. So just so everybody's clear, a yes, a yes vote uh, is for denial. Yes, based on being chastised earlier by Jackie, <laughs> stating it. That is absolutely correct, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will call the roll call now. Uh, Joe? Uh, yes. Uh, Flavia? Yes. Cassandra? Yes. Uh, Sandberg? Yes. Uh, Clapper? Yes. The petition is denied. Um, thank you very much. That was the last case for this evening, so we are adjourned.